We're back. We're back. We're back. Pipe Dreams Podcast. Uh, we've been on a little bit of a hiatus, Jimmy and I. Um, you know, it's tough doing these things. We've come to realize when uh, when we're both all over the country and we're racing and, and we don't have a proper a proper studio. So um, it's been a little bit, what, about a month now, I think? Yeah, we went on a month hiatus. We've uh, decided that, hey, bringing it out to Laguna was not the, not the play call, just with logistics and things. But for now, I mean... We got some exciting news, and but first off, let's do some housekeeping. First of all, everybody that's bought a T-shirt, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, it's been huge. It's been massive. We got a couple things we want to bring out, like what, like some, Jim. Jim's a big mug guy. Yeah, I want I want some <laughs> mugs. I want uh, some like some trinket things, you yeah. know. So let us know if you guys want anything, whether it be like hats or mugs or tumblers or things of that nature. <laughs> You name it, Jimmy's gonna merchandise it. We're gonna do it. We're gonna put a logo, <laughs> slap a logo on it, and try to try to sell it. But it's all because of you guys that we have all this equipment. We've got guests, and we keep going. But we've got some exciting news. Yeah, I yeah, mean, this big. is big. We're doing it big now. Uh, well, it just means that we're committed. <laughs> so we got a new sponsor, um, Law Tigers. They've come on board. They're a personal sponsor of mine. And yeah, I mean, let's run through it. Uh, Law Tigers is the American motorcycle lawyers. I mean, these guys are it. Pretty much if you, you got to prepare for this kind of stuff. Like you don't want to, nobody knows if you're going to crash, right? Like nobody wants to end up in that situation, but it happens. It happens. So be prepared. Have, uh, you know, these guys on speed dial. 1-800-LAW-TIGERS. These guys are, uh, they're, they're for the people, man. They're, they're, they're the only brands really supporting racing on a big level. And, uh, probably have seen them around a bunch and on, on more of the cruiser market, but they're trying to get into the sport bike segment a bit and and sport uh sport bike riders so it's really really amazing to have them have them a part of the podcast yeah and if you know somebody or you were hurt yourself obviously call 911 but then call law tigers 1-800 law tigers and we can't thank them enough for coming on board we've got them for what 10 episodes now yeah the contracts uh, <laughs> fresh fresh ink on that baby <laughs> we got tank here supporting the pod <laughs> yep, tank yep. the tiger but dude let's get into it we got a, a cool guest here um, we, we did a poll yesterday Nobody, uh, do we have anyone guess it? I don't think, I think maybe one person guessed it. Yeah. I, I think maybe our guests guessed it. I don't know. <laughs> I think we have one person, but, uh, he's, uh, he's been around for quite a while. He's probably one of the most, uh, well-known household names, if you will, in, uh, American road racing and, and I think motor motorcycle racing in general in the U S. Um, but it's kind of been like the spokesperson for road racing for almost 20 years. It's just kind of crazy to think 20 years, but it's coming up quick. Right. I think, uh, Two more years, I think I read or something. Two thousand six. Two thousand six was your first pro year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we got a. Uh, you want to. You want to. Yeah. Do it? So we got Josh Aaron here. Surprising enough, I didn't know you were a year older than me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, like you've been around for so long, but at the same time, I'm like, I feel like you're still young. I don't know. I don't feel like you're. I mean. I'm old, I'm 32 as well, so I just James turned. still feels like he's pretty young. So, so really I'm putting is. you in my. In, <laughs> I'm putting you with me that we're just too young, but you've been around for so long. I mean, I was looking up, uh, so just doing some googling and like Graves at 15. Uh, I mean, that's got to be insane. And you've been around for so long. You've done so much. You've rode so many motorcycles for different factories and different teams all around. You've gone over to Europe and come back. I mean. So many different things. Well, welcome Josh Heron to Pipe Dreams Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. We appreciate it. Thanks, man. This is uh yeah, I'm excited. This is, you know, something like I told you guys I've been I've been watching this and and uh yeah, I'm excited to to come and talk to you guys. It's different talking to racers than it is talking to people who don't race, right? So it's Greg especially White. <laughs> <laughs> He's pissed. We'll just we'll just we'll just get it out there. He's gonna be pissed. Especially just people that we're racing with right now. Like, so everything is, you know, we got a lot of, a lot of stuff that's, uh, you know, we're thinking the same thing. We're on the same wavelength. Same wavelength. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me on and, and thanks for that introduction. That was, that was nice. hundred <laughs> percent. Might have been the nicest thing anybody's ever said. <laughs> it's true, man. I mean, I think, uh, you know, even like when we started out, you were, you were already kind of established. So it was like, even though you're similar age to us, you're kind of always looking up to you because you've been kind of the guy for for almost 20 years now which is crazy to think but it's crazy i remember going to mid ohio and seeing you with the agv leathers <laughs> rebel helmet and i was like that's what i, I want that like, yeah, I want. it was what is axo after that right yeah axo was zach the, was axo yeah uh, okay. <laughs> it was like agv and then then we did like a i don't know yamaha yamalube and like gytr paid for like 
they just bought Joe Rocket leathers and like rebranded them for a couple of years. <laughs> that was weird. But what's weird though is I, because I was AGV, but my suits never looked like yours. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going like, well, how come his suits look so good and my, <laughs> mine are kind of not? I, I went was, through like, that stage, <laughs> dude. One time I sh- my suit showed up, and I'm not even kidding you. It had uh, like. You're gonna think I'm lying right now, but it had like sandwich, like baggy, like z- like the thin Ziploc baggy material, like covering the patches. Like it was like the <laughs> gnarliest thing I've ever seen. My dad's like, "What is this?" <laughs> Old man, some other stuff. was bad. <laughs> but they, uh, yeah, that, that was cool, man. Like I saw Maladin were in AGV for a long time, and I've I just wanted to be in them for 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 a while. And they had two different manufacturers, so that was a the thing. They had um, I forget what one of them was called. It was like. G Moto made one like they made their others, and then Vercos made their yeah, leathers. I remember Vercos, and you had to know which which factory to ask for to do your leathers because they had two factories pumping them out, and that was that was the <laughs> trick. <laughs> did you uh, did you have Red Bull before you went to Graves? Oh no 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 Graves was so we started with Graves in '05. Uh, we did Weira, and then AMA. My first race was '06, and I think I got Red Bull in '08. Oh, okay. it's pretty late. Yeah. Yeah, it was like, but like everybody, I mean, it's like a childhood dream to get like a Red Bull type sponsor. And yeah, that was huge. Kind of crazy sure. that, uh, I mean, obviously you got kind of forced into the monster deal a little bit with the team, which kind of stinks when you're Red Bull, because once you leave, it's nearly impossible to come back, it seems like. Um, but it's also generally impossible to go from one energy drink to another. I mean, that's got to be kind of crazy. I know we're jumping a little bit, but kind of crazy to you were with the two biggest energy drink companies yeah that that was something that it it ended up being good like I'm glad that it worked out the way that it did in some ways but for me Red Bull was like they're they're here they still are I mean that's that's like the the top top company to be with right and I me and my dad tried so hard to get that deal we finally got it and uh yeah, whenever Monster sponsored Yamaha in 2011, going in 2011, they basically said, like, hey, we, you got to get rid of the Red Bull deal. And I was so bummed out because that was such a huge deal for me. And it, it wasn't just a sponsor. Like, we made good money with them. But also it was, like, the, the opportunities that they gave me. Like, oh, I wanted to go to Indy and watch the GP race. Like, they flew me there first class, put me in a hotel, like, let me get in all the parties, like, anything I wanted to do. I wanted to go like flying airplanes with the Kirby guy. Like I, I just got to do anything with him and I'm good friends with him. You know him. And I, I love the guy. I love his wife, Alex Dunstan. But at the time, whenever they like they, the deal got signed, he sent me a text and he's like, what's up? I can't remember exactly what it said, but it was like, what's up, bro? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Alex. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm calling you out right now, but it was like, welcome to the dark side, oh. the land of like black babes and partying or something. And I'm just like, Dude. that was the last thing that I wanted to read whenever I was giving up my Red Bull deal. And it ended up being great, like, you know, because it, what was I going to do? I was going to leave Yamaha for the deal. Like, but part of me, like looking back, like longevity wise, like maybe that was the play at the time. I don't know, like, because I there's so many things I missed out on in my life because I wasn't with Red Bull. And th- I actually did get a chance to go back with them when I was at um, Yosh, and I messed up because they were like, hey, Jeremy Mouat was like, come back. You know, um, I-, I went and talked to him about some, like, video stuff. He's like, come use the gym, use the trainers, like, see how you like it, see what the vibes are, and let's see if we can make something happen. And somebody that's close to me was like, no, don't don't go do anything without getting paid, like, they weren't wanting me to put any logos or anything, but they were offering for me to be a part of the family again. And I listened to that person and I, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life was just because I, yeah, like you said, like they told me at the time, if you leave, you can't, you're probably not going to ever get to come back. And then they gave me the chance to come back. And yeah, I, I just listened to the, the person I listened to, I still trust and listen to him, but I just make sure I make my own gut decisions now. Um, but it, that was a big mistake. I kind of want to like sidestep a little bit back into that. You said your dad um, was part of, was he kind of like managing you back then? Was that kind of how that started out? Yeah, whenever I was, obviously, you know, um, I didn't have a manager until, I don't even know, maybe 2011. But my dad did basically all my deals um, until I was like 18. So 2008 or so, 
and then then I started doing my own. But yeah, he was he was pushing with the Red Bull deal. I don't remember exactly. I have like the worst memory ever, but it, I, I remember like I started the talks, and then me and my dad kind of like, you know, we did it together. Right? He negotiated it, but mm-hmm. I was like the one always texting with Jeremy Mlot. I think as a kid, just like please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've all been there. Yeah. Where um, so you grew up in California, and then you guys moved to Georgia at some point. Which yeah, is, that's crazy. I didn't actually know you were from California. I don't know why I seem to do this a lot with a lot of people, but I like he does, I had, all, he does a little homework and he's like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, well, I had no idea that you were from California. So, yeah. where were you from in California? Uh, so, I was born in Glendale, which is where I'm living now, um, which is like right outside LA, right near Dodger Stadium. Um, which is actually where Joe Roberts was born. We didn't even know until I was until we were teammates that he actually the house he grew up in and he still lives in with his family was one mile from the house I grew up in. And my aunt would go running all the time from our house and go right by his race trail and always tell like me, my mom, my dad, like, Oh, there's somebody else with motorcycles that lives down the street as we got older, right? Like maybe when I was like eleven, twelve, whatever. And it ended up being that it was Joe Roberts' place because the first time I went to his house, I'm like, what the hell? Like, I, I lived right here. How did we never know? And nobody ever talked about that there was two of us from Glendale because this was in 2015 whenever we found out. So, yeah, it was, it was cool. That's crazy. So and you guys ended up in, in Georgia when? Yeah, when I was, like, going into high school. So I think I was, tw- I think, like, 2002, right at the end of 2002, going into 2003, we moved to Georgia. My dad was from there, and um, he... He was like super disconnected from his dad when he was young. So whenever I was around the time I was born, he like met his dad for the first time. And he was just kind of over like the L.A. hustle, like having to drive two, three hours to go to work because he does construction. So it was always like different jobs somewhere else. And so we, you know, they decided to sell our place, move out there. And he, he wanted to get away from it, but he also wanted to like, be able to have like something for us to do and not just be gridlocked all the time. So we, we bought like 10 acres out there for, I think at the time it was like 3000 bucks an acre or something, which you could still find that in Georgia, but it's still like 30 grand is what we bought the land that the Heron compounds on. And we just had, you know, XR 100 flat tracks and little motocross tracks and stuff like that. And then, um, I actually moved away from, from Georgia when I was 18, and that's when they built the Heron compound, which was Middle Georgia Kart Track at the time. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, but all my family's mainly still out there. Oh, okay. That's so cool. How, how much into racing when you moved were you? Was it everything, or were you into other sports at the time? Like, what was the like what was the balance like at, you said 12 yeah. is roughly when you moved? Yeah, it was, um, I would say it was, like, all-in racing at that okay. time. Okay, okay. Like, I, I was I was into I grew up baseball and basketball like that was like my thing growing up and road racing was like my hobby with my dad, um, and then when we moved to Georgia I was like too shy to go into high school and try to play baseball there so I didn't play anymore and that so that was like the real transition into road racing which was um, at the time we were going into USGPRU on one twenty fives and yeah I did like one year at high school and then we we pulled out because it just. I don't know. It was like so much different. I know it's only been what it's, you know, it's not been that long, like 10, 15 years, but it, the, everything was so much different whenever we moved there. Like, I don't, I don't want to get into all, but just like, I I got bullied at school. Like it, it was just weird. Like I was a California kid coming to Georgia. They were you know, they all like were making gay jokes because I wore tight pants <laughs> and like it was just a weird thing. And I just didn't fit in with anybody. And racing, you know, like growing up at the track, like you you have your social skills. You you meet so many people that I felt like I didn't need that. I, I so I never finished high school. I, I wish I did. I'm, I'll probably, you know, end up doing it pretty soon here. I've been looking into like Carmichael did it. And I was like, I need to finish because it's not like I'm an idiot, but I just want to say I did it. Right. Um so, uh, yeah, 125 is USGPRU, and then we were at the next year, 2015. So did you do home, 2005. <laughs> you did homeschooling, or you didn't do anything? You kind of just We, stopped. like, we tried the homeschool thing, but my it, it just didn't work. Like, they weren't on me enough to do it, and we were traveling, and, you know, I'll, I'll always regret it, but I'm glad that I went through it because I, now I know what I want for my son. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, and, and uh, so it just didn't work out. I don't I went, know why. I went through that sim- literally similar thing when we moved from New Hampshire to New York. 
I only did a couple of years and then was homeschooled and I didn't finish until 2019. I went back yeah. and got my high school diploma for real estate. Oh, good for you. Yeah, yeah. So like I get it, but I remember it's weird when I moved to New York, which is kind of country as well, where I was from Western New York and, uh, it was like the same thing. It was like I was kind of a loser racing motorcycles. Now all of my friends are like, dude, that's so cool. Like, dude, like, that's awesome. But, like, I wasn't a jock yeah. then. So it was kind of they were always looking like, you're weird. Like, I went through the same thing. I'm like, dude, I'm not <laughs> weird. I just ride bikes. <laughs> dude, I, I wish one of the things that I wish I would have done so bad was stay in high school because when I was 16, I think I made probably, like, 200 or 250,000 bucks. Like, how would, <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> you, I would have... It's good that I didn't, but I would have flexed so hard. I'm yeah. like, fuck all of you. <laughs> I'm making money. Like, yeah. But, and, and I would have been in high school with a Red Bull deal on TV. Like, it would have been sick. Like, I think of like the Sheckler show. I, like, obviously, yeah. I'm not Ryan Sheckler, but it would have like been the closest thing to that that I could have imagined. And I, I wish I would have stayed just because there was so many people that I would have been, it would have felt good to like show them. But it, do, you, do you think it humbled you at all? Or do you. Um, what, what part of it? Like the whole, just the high school thing? Yeah. Like not being able to show like flash, um, you know, you say like at 16, having that amount of money is pretty insane. Um, to be able, like could have got dangerous pretty quickly. It was, yeah, I don't know. Or did it drive you? Like, no, I I don't think either. I think it was, you know, I, I had my buddies in Georgia that I had met like Ryan Clay, which was a kid that raced. You probably met him. Yeah. 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 So I raced with him in USGPRU. His brother Dylan Clay. They ended up being my best friends for a long time. They lived up in Georgia and and uh, or sorry in Atlanta. And so we got to like, I lived my like high school kind of years with them and and got to do everything I wanted to do. And and uh, yeah, I don't think either. I, I dude, high school just bummed me out. It's more than anything because I had such a good life in California. And it ended up being a good move that my family did to bring us out there. I think at the time, but but um, yeah, it was like right in like the like kind of glory days for me as a kid like I just got just moved it was almost like a Disney channel show like you're watching like somebody move into a new school getting bullied and it just it was a weird thing and I think confidence wise it messed me up more than anything because I didn't I couldn't figure out how to like fit in with those people and now now I have a bunch of friends from there and it's it's cool but at the time it was just hard do you think not having a graduated high school like as you've grown up has affected your confidence as well just kind of like is that something that weighed on you not you know, I think it's something subconsciously always kind of have an effect on you as you as you get a little bit older. Maybe, maybe not now where you're at in life, but when you're in your younger younger twenties or or even late teens, like kind of knowing you didn't have that on your in, in your in your resume, I guess if you will, did that affect you at all? Yeah, I mean, this is a f- I, I've brought it up before, but I've never like publicly brought it up, and it's it's always been kind of weird. So it honestly felt like a little bit good just to get off my chest right now, even though nobody cares. But yeah. it just felt good. Um. But it's always been something that just made me nervous. Like when people start talking about schooling, I'm like, fuck, like I'm, it's not like street smart wise. Like I'm, I feel like I'm on another level compared to most of the people that I meet that went through high school and college and all that stuff. But I just feel like embarrassed sometimes to be like, I didn't finish high school. Like, and it wasn't, it's not because I couldn't do it. It just, it just didn't work out. Like I luckily you know, you look at the way that everybody talks on social media now about like not needing college. And I'm not saying that that's the right thing to do, but like I saw something the other day that, and I don't know if this, this stat is true, but it was about like most successful entrepreneurs nowadays were, you know, getting C's in high school or in school, whatever. Right. Um, but I think like the hustle is different. Like when you don't go through high school and then you don't go through college, like there's some kind of different hustle. And I never, I don't know. I just never liked high school I never liked school at all um so that's probably why I didn't finish the homeschool because I just didn't have the drive but um yeah it's like an embarrassing subject sometimes because I feel like I'm lesser than some people because they didn't do it and like even to get a job at like McDonald's you need a high school diploma which is like whoa like crazy. I'm not saying I'm better than somebody that works at McDonald's but it's like that's like the bottom of the totem pole as far as jobs go like that's the first thing that people usually try to do and I couldn't even get one right now if I wanted to go work there so that's yeah. why sometimes I'm like what kind of example am I for Griffin if I didn't even finish high school so I think I'm I'll end up doing it in the next year or two now that we're mm-hmm. moving and kind of getting settled in yeah no that's cool I think it's a societal kind of stigma right yeah. and like you said it's starting to get broken there's so many other ways to make money now and I think you know 
may, may, you may or may not realize it, but that's probably part of the reason why you hustled so hard racing, right? It's like in your mind, you're like, I have no other option. I've <laughs> got to make this work right every year. It's like, you know, and that's kind of just talking with James over the years. And, and I know James, you got your, your diploma. When was it like three years ago now? 2019 yeah. during, like, or 19 to 20, right? When kind of COVID and all that, I would just went back and did it because I needed it for real estate. I was in a tough time as well. And I mean, I've talked yeah. about it before and, but I think 10 years ago, it was like, I was in the same boat. I remember when people used to just talk about schools and whatnot. I used to like try to like, like yeah. change subject. Don't raise my hand. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ask me. Like, well, I think even like just knowing you and like pre and post, like there's a little bit of a change there. And it's just a confidence, I think. And like, it's, well, it's, it's just like something that, I mean, for me, it was like, if I can do that, like if I can just put the work in and do that. And it, I was, dude, I went to 11th grade. So like I only had one year left. Yeah. And it was just like, there's nothing now that nobody can do anything. Like, I've yeah, got it. Can't take it away from you. Yeah, I mean, so, like, yeah. for me, it was more just, like, screw you. I got it. Yeah. You know, like, but, like, I'm in the same boat, like, where it's, like, not dumb, street smart. I mean, at 16, having that amount of money, you have to learn. You have to grow up quick. You got to learn how to be financially illiterate. You got to be, um, you've got to really learn. You got to grow up quick yeah. in racing. And I feel like people don't really take that. They just look at it. So, yeah. yeah. Interesting. What about, um? it's obviously kind of interesting. I mean, Georgia was always a little bit of a hot spot for racing, but obviously California is kind of like, especially where you were from, is kind of like the hub for, for yeah. motorcycle racing. Do you think it helped or, or hurted you? At the time, so when we moved, like I said, we were, we were uh, it was like 2003, so it was actually the opposite. Like all the fast dudes were on the East Coast. Like mm. we had Robert Jensen, Mike Smith, Trey Beatty, Mark Young, like all these dudes were, and you know, you had your Jeremy Toys and Chris Siglin at the time, Jason Perez, um, but they were mainly just racing at Willow or like AFM stuff. Um, but the fast, fast guys, like Robert Jensen was getting on the podium in, in Formula Extreme and Supersport at the time. So that was like, it ended up being perfect. And all the USGPRU races were mainly on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. We only had a couple on the West Coast. So I think it helped a lot because Robert Jensen was like Valentino Rossi to me. Like I beat him for the first time and I raced all of 05, didn't beat him. And then 06, we had um, our first pro year, but I had to wait until May. So we raced at Jennings in like March or something and I was able to beat him. And that was like, boom, like I felt so good after that. Um, that was like what I needed to like be ready for pro racing mm -hmm. was if I can't beat Robert Jensen, like, what am I doing going right. into pro racing? Like, me and my dad both knew that. Like, we have to beat this guy. So um, I think it helped. Because if, if we would have stayed on the West Coast, we would end up at Willow Springs all the time. And and it just seems like when you go there a lot, for whatever reason, be, maybe because they only race there every month, kind of like Chuck Walla, like, people just get good there. And then you're like, oh, we'll just – it's easy to say, let's just race at Chuck Walla again instead yeah. of, oh, let's go do Thunder Hill this month. And you have a championship you want to win and – Maybe if you don't, maybe if you start the year like going to different AFM races, but you do bad in one, and you're like, oh, we'll just finish Chuck Wall, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So at the time, I, I think it was good, and I got to go ride dirt bikes more than I ever did by having land in Georgia, and so it was it was good for me racing it, it, and it was, it's it's weird, like I don't know if it was the best family decision like long term, but for me racing it ended up working out. And for my brother Gavin, who loves to hunt and do all that stuff, like that was perfect for him. But for Zach and my sister Zoe, like I don't, I don't know if it was the best thing, but it was just what our family needed at the time. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so you said you moved at eighteen. You moved back to California. Yeah, <laughs> i i started I started dating my first girlfriend in two, the end of two thousand seven, and it was like the worst case scenario for like relationship between my family and then us they like they did not want me with her and I just was blinded and didn't see it like my dad would literally like <laughs> oh my god I've never talked about this like <laughs> <laughs> like I remember one time we left road America in the RV because we used to drive to the races once I turned pro like we got RV and we went to the races together because my dad somehow in his mind, even to this day, thinks it's cheaper to have an RV. <laughs> okay, you have one. <laughs> like I, really quick right like, I always knew, like, what is wrong with you? Like, at the, I mean, we had like a, I think it was like a revolution. It was like a $300,000 bus or something. It was probably, I don't know what the payment was, but it was high. And then gas and then 
like fixing it and then paying to <laughs> camp it at the races. Like it's way more expensive and yeah. way more work. But we left Road America and maybe I didn't do good. I don't know. And it was always her fault. And, it, <laughs> and looking back, it was. <laughs> it definitely was. But he just like dropped her off. He left her at the Ostoff in Wisconsin and said, <laughs> like, you're the team is going to take you to the airport. We're leaving. <laughs> she was like, I think she was 18, but still, like, it just, it was not good. And, you know, he was right. He just didn't know how to handle the situation. Yeah. And my mom did, but my mom let my dad kind of like run the show because my dad was a hothead. And he was right. But like I said, just didn't know how to do it. Didn't know how to tell me the right way. And uh, so I just like rebelled and just wanted to get out of there. So, um, you know, when I first started making money, so like, Oh six, oh six. It was still me and my dad. Like we had Yamaha support. They gave us some money, and then Graves built our bikes and stuff. But it was us going to the races. My mom, me, my mom and dad. Oh seven was the first year that I was like factory. Well, it was Graves, but it was the factory six hundred program, kind of like pro circuit for Supercross. Mm-hmm. And um, like the money that was coming in from racing was for the. It was like going to the family, like, and that's fine because. I know what it took to get me there. And like, I, even to this day, like I don't care about money. Like it's, and it wasn't that they were like leeching or being weird like that. It just, it just went to the family. That's how we were. And that that's, that's fine. Um, but when I left, it was like, I'm leaving. Like I, I'm not, I just left whatever money was in my account. I just went to California and, and moved there. And, um, that was like the, probably the worst decision I ever made, to be honest. Um, but I'm a firm believer in like things happen for a reason and I'm, I'm where I'm at today because of these decisions I made. Um, and, and, uh, so I'm, when I look back, I'm happy, but, uh, yeah, it was, that was bad. I I shouldn't, shouldn't have done that. Why, why do you, why do you think that is? Uh, because it just, it took a long time to get that relationship back with my parents because, um, that was in 2008 and I didn't really get a good relationship back with my family until like, 2000 maybe 2012 2013 Mm. somewhere on there and it never really was like super good until 2017 whenever I I was done with with uh with my ex um and it just yeah it was just I was just different being Mm. you know in that relationship and I didn't see it until it was way too late and and uh yeah that that was what I regretted most about it do you that yeah. Do you think that affected your racing? Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. I've I've had so many people that you know, now that they know that they can talk about those things with and I'm always open to anybody telling me anything. I was a kid whenever I was going through a lot of stuff, but you know, they've there's been so many people that have said like the things you could have accomplished if you weren't in that relationship. Because like I I remember one thing, like I said, I have a bad memory, but I do remember like one thing specifically. I think it was like 2011 and this would happen all the time, but I was getting suited up to go out for the race and I'm with Sean Estes and my buddy Rob Salcedo who they were working for shift and bell, but now they work for specialized and they're all over. But, um, we, I was like suiting up to go race and we got into like just this screaming match. Like I'm literally like getting ready to go out on the track and we're just screaming in the factory Yamaha trailer, probably about like some monster girl that, was just saying hi or something like it was just something stupid like that and i mean i don't know if you remember me when i was 2000 whatever that was 2012 11 like i had like a fucked up grill like i was not like the best looking dude and no girl was coming to talk to me like that and it just it was just always like that it was so toxic and i don't i'm not pointing fingers at anybody but it it just it wasn't a good situation like you know, like you guys both know, like you don't want to be doing that before a race and sponsors were looking at it. And I remember, I remember, man, 2010, somewhere, I think 2010, when I was like fighting Eslick for the championship, maybe 2011, he took me out at Barber. And I remember that was nuts. We were Suzuki. <laughs> we were Suzuki boys. <laughs> was that the one with the, with the after the race, right? And you're, yeah, was it your the post race thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, it's legendary. I lost. Yeah. <laughs> not only did I lose the championship that day because I think I only needed to finish like whatever position, but 
I lost probably like three hundred thousand dollars that day because it was like first place from Yamaha was a quarter million dollars to win the championship. <sighs> Maybe even more. Wow. I want to say it was more than that. And at first second place in the championship, I got zero. So it was like, yeah, it sucked. What? <laughs> yeah. Holy. And that day, so he took me out like it is what it is. Like looking back on it now, it's I think it's hilarious because I would have spent the money anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> it matter <laughs> but that day, so my dad got into this yelling match with S. Like I think he said, "Nice takeout, asshole," or something. Way to take my kid out, ass, yeah. something like just a dad thing. He's, yeah, he's heated for his kid, right? Like, do you remember? I mean, I remember like. Um, uh, Sean Dillon Kelly's dad throwing the water yeah. bottle at Hayden Gillum. It's just like <laughs> yeah, one yeah. of those things, right? And Danny Essex doing an interview with Greg White with like this cast on, and he has a missing tooth over here, and he's just like, I think he said like, "You want to go, pussy?" or something <laughs> like that. It's so good, dude. <laughs> Probably smoking a cig. <laughs> oh man. Um, but she said something on Twitter like, "I hope you get." I don't even know if we can say this. If we can't, I hope you guys cut this out. But, like, I hope you get AIDS and die or something. Oh like, <laughs> Dude, who says that? Like, yeah. put it on Twitter. Like, Yam- it was like every month Yamaha was getting mad at me about something that she did. And it, I never saw, like, and I, like, whatever my relationship is with Yamaha now doesn't matter. Like, they, they looked after me. Like, they, when I was a kid, like, they gave me so many chances. They were, like, Keith McCarty and Tom Alverson and like all those guys, like they, they really did look after me and like gave me so many opportunities as a kid. And if I was running a race team, like, I don't care how good you are. I'm not dealing with that stuff. Like ever, like ever, like I'm, I'm just not. (laughs) So I'll always be grateful for that. But it was just always things like that going on in my life that I just, man, it was just so toxic. And I, the, the weight that got lifted off my shoulders whenever I just became like my own person at 27 years old, and then how incredibly different it was finding somebody like Rachel, like having somebody that like actually supports you. And it doesn't matter if I say I want to go be a woodworker or I want to put only fans on my helmet or I want to, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I say. She's like a hundred percent there for me unless it's something stupid. And she's telling me no, because it's a bad idea, not because she's a dream crusher or I've, we've never gotten in like some crazy argument. Like we're she, you just, it's so great. And that you don't realize like how much that probably held me back in racing or I didn't until I had something that was like really good for me. And it wasn't just my ex though. It was my family too, because no matter like how bad it was, they shouldn't have made it about us. It should have just been like he'll learn or something. And me and my dad have a great relationship. Me and my mom have a great relationship. I my dad comes to every race. But like the the things that he did was just bad. Like it just shouldn't have been done like that. And and uh yeah, I mean, because we whenever me and my ex would argue, it's like it would affect me, I'm sure, a, a lot. But then whenever it would make me and my dad argue, that was what really got in my head because it's somebody that I really cared about. And I was like bummed that my dad was let down about something. But I was also becoming a man and I didn't want my dad like just yelling at me all the time. So I'd stand up to him. And yeah, looking back at it, like I, I wish that part was different. But like I said, things happen for a reason. Mm-hmm. And and I'm here now. So what was uh, what, what was the big like turning point for you that kind of you realized that or made that decision to to make a change? In what year? You said you were 27. Yeah, I was. I was just like, I was gonna get. I was engaged to get married, and I was like, this is literally something I shouldn't be doing. Like, I remember like we had like broke up, and she went and like slept with somebody else, and and then like manipulated me into thinking like the only way I'm staying with you is if we get engaged. And it just like, you know, we all have friends that have done this whole thing before. Mm-hmm. And I, you just like, no matter how unhappy you were, somehow they manipulate you into this situation. And then I'm one day wake up, I've put off marriage for like three, four years being engaged together, five years. And I just woke up and I was like, what am I doing? Like, it was like right, like the day before Christmas or something. And I'm just like, whoa, like I, I got to get out of here. And I just said, I'm leaving. And I just, took whatever I could fit in my truck and I just took off and never looked back. <laughs> like I had never answered phone calls. Like I, I just had to get out and, um, yeah, I, I was lucky that that happened because 
I don't know what, what I would have been yeah. like if I stayed there and I've never gone back to Fresno and my best friend, John John's, he lives there and I've just don't go back. Cause I just don't want to even think about things. Not, not, you know, I don't know. I just, yeah. even if I'm not thinking about it, it's there. Like yeah. it's, it's almost like a ghost. Like it's right. Even going back to Georgia, like I, I don't go back to Dublin a whole lot to the Heron compound because I just have so many bad memories of things happening that I just don't even want to feel that energy and that. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because uh, obviously like you're in a stage in your career where you're kind of working on a bunch of different things. You get the woodwork and stuff like that. The Heron compound doesn't really come up as much, though. So I was kind of curious why that was and what the deal was with it, like what your, I guess, kind of vision for it, if it's even your thing, which it sounds like it's more of your family that's down there still, right? Yeah, man, it, it bums me out so bad because I, I, I need to just forget about my family feelings and just focus on helping my mom and my sister because they're the ones that run the track um I don't know I just I haven't been back because I just like I said it's like bad energy there and it's not my mom and my sister at all because I love mm -hmm. them to death I just I have bad memories and I have so many good memories too I mean I, I loved growing up there and I, I loved running races there but when I stopped running races there and then and then I moved to California and I just thought about how much bad stuff went on there it just bums me out all the time and I wish so bad I could just like pick it up and move it somewhere else <laughs> and I, I've looked into building another track so many different times um and my mom and my sister they you know they they work so hard to try to make that place good but it's it's hard I mean taking care of 10 acres by yourself like that is hard and you know sometimes I feel like I let my mom down like I don't I don't do it enough but it's it's like a and she understands i think it's i think without us ever talking about it she understands like it's just something's not right about yeah you gotta be selfish a little bit with yeah it. yeah yeah i think that's the hard part just in general like james probably the same way his family's kind of been all over the place like your sister's up up north but like racing is selfish right yeah. so it's maybe once you're done racing that you'll be able to kind of work through that in a way where it's not going to potentially affect what you got going on right now right yeah I don't even know if it's just racing. It's just life. Like there, it just came a point in my life where I, I just was like, got rid of so many people that I talked to or whatever. Like we just get older and we, we just realize like, I need like one friend, my wife. Now I have my kids. So I don't really need anybody <laughs> and, and I'm happy. And I just, we have so many things pulling us around as racers, I think we don't realize it and people look at us like like it's a joke like because they look at baseball and basketball and they're like you know they look at that like jobs but they look at us like it's a joke because i don't know i don't know why maybe because we're not making millions but i, I don't really know why actually because i've felt like my whole life um people always make me feel like racing isn't enough like it's i make more money than almost anybody that i know um, but they make me feel like I'm not like, I don't know the way to describe it, but they make me seem like they make me feel like racing isn't a job and I shouldn't like, I'm just spoiled. And I don't know, I don't know the, the, the right way to say it, but it's, it sucks. Cause you, you always feel like you have the coolest job in the world. I want to be so grateful for what I do. I've been able to race motorcycles and make money for, this is my 18th year doing it. But I, I still feel like almost like somebody telling me like go get a job like when are you going to grow up type of thing and when you close your circle down you you don't feel that anymore but I think at, at the end of the day and I, I don't say this to be you know to sound like an asshole or anything but I think it's a jealousy thing because people are bummed that they maybe have to go to work and I, and I always felt guilty for them because they made me feel like their life was hard and I, that's just a hard thing to live with and I I know that it sounds like I'm like for me when I hear myself saying that I, I feel just mean for saying it but it's it just I don't know it's a weird feeling well the scale goes up you know like when you look at like what they just offer Mbappe like a 1.1 billion dollars for that deal and you're like like a hundred thousand dollars here is like pretty yeah. good money <laughs> and you're like you can't even fathom like what he's like 64 million a month or yeah. some, something like that. And you're like, like the scale is so like, yeah. you know, it's just, I kind of understand what you're saying. Like, I think also, cause it, like you said, it's not a, it's not like a, there's no celebrity to it. Right. I mean, you're like 
arguably the most famous American motorcycle racer, right? And like in the in the grand scheme of things, if you look at athletes and whatnot, it's like we don't get the same respect because it's not that big. Maybe. You so know? then people kind of just look at it like it's like trivial. You can't get paid to race motorcycles type of thing. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. That's I think that's why I always I feel like people just see it as a hobby. Yeah. And they don't <laughs> see it as a job. And, they just think and, we're all rich or something. Yeah. And we just our parents pay for it. I, I don't know what they think. <laughs> Um, I think F1 has changed it a little bit because now people are like, see the show and they're like, yeah. oh, you, you race, you must be, you yeah. must be like those guys. And it's like, well, not really. We just like it a lot. That's yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why I always like the woodworking and the coaching and uh, like sign making. Like I always like try to like find something else. Like I think that's why social media like and all that kind of stuff like made me chase that because I felt like, okay, if I can get the gratification from making money doing this then i'll feel good about myself because for some reason with racing like i never i think that's what it is i think it's more of a me problem than other people <laughs> but i just because from talking to some people i always felt like racing wasn't good enough like i wasn't i didn't have a real job and things like that so i always tried to like do like other hustles to make money to be like look i, I make money just like you doing something else that i have to work at every day and work hard at it and i think maybe that's what it is mm. is something like that i don't i don't know do you ever think that ties back to like the whole high school thing like not even feeling like you were because you hadn't finished high school you're not kind of on you, you didn't start out even on the same playing field as as some of these people who work just a nine to five and probably make a quarter of what you you've made in your career it's it sounds kind of nuts but sometimes i think because <laughs> sometimes i think because i was fortunate enough fortunate enough to be in the situation that i'm in and make money from a young age that i always maybe it was me that just felt guilty for not having a normal job like my friends did. And then I always kind of craved having a normal job like my friends did. And so I put myself in those situations, whether it's like working for my dad in construction or doing the woodworking or the social media has kind of taken over, taken over with that. But I've, I've always kind of like felt like I needed to be normal maybe. Mm. I, yeah. don't know. I mean, I feel like I can get behind that a little bit. Like, I feel like I've never really had a real job. And I always felt like real estate last year was probably the realest job I've ever had. I mean, I've never, like, had a W-2. Yeah. Like, I remember I, like, like even, like, trying to get, a, like, a job at Subway. Like, I, I never got it. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You like, tried? Yeah. I, really? I, yeah, why one not, time. Why not Jimmy Johns? Yeah. I don't, well, it was bad. You did? It was in no, Attica. I said, I said oh. why not Jimmy Johns? No, like, I've never really had a real job. Like, maybe some stuff under the table. But, yeah. like, real estate was probably last year. And now that I've done it, I'm like, I could do it. But I'm focused on racing. I don't know. It's, Wait, why uh, didn't you get the job at Subway? I don't know. Probably because I didn't have a high school diploma. <laughs> they just said, no, we're not. Did they I didn't even reply. Really? Yeah. That's man. crazy. I was young. I can I, I can know. relate a little. I mean, I've my family has the motorcycle shop, so I've worked there. And, like, there was a point where I wasn't racing for, like, four years. And I was literally, like, nine to six every day. Grinding. There, which was I remember. Sea Dog was <laughs> grinding. Yeah. I, I was used to the, come I was in. salesman. Okay. <laughs> I used to come in and sit at his desk and just, like, take pictures of hats and post them on social media. <laughs> and he's just there, like, burr, burr, burr. Yeah. and I'm like, we got to get out of here. Like wasn't one's fun. lunch. <laughs> wasn't fun. I think, I think something that I've learned is like, even just hearing you talk about it, it's just perspective. A lot of it's just perspective. Yeah. It's like for me, not having a job has always been like, I'd rather do everything I possibly can to not have a job to be like, fuck you guys. You guys got to work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even, but I also get the other side of it. Like I walk into the dealership now and I haven't worked in like two years. I've been fortunate enough to do this stuff. And, and I see my dad, you know, my dad, my uncle, like my whole family works there. And I'm like, I have like this like guilt almost because I'm like walking in like I got no stress. Yeah. I'm just kind of, but at the same time, I'm like, this is great. I don't want to go back to sitting behind the desk and dealing with people. I think you're people. right though. I think every year that I get older, I appreciate how like, I don't know if the word's luck or like just thankful of I'm still able to race yeah. and still have to make enough money to pay the bills and do it and like live this dream. Like I think the more social media and the more everything becomes accessible, I see how many people hate their jobs. Yeah. And the more I love it, I'm like, ooh, like I've got something. And I get I like I get nervous that I'm like because I've always wanted to go and do other things and like make more money. But I always like walk on that line and I go, ooh, but I love what I do. Yeah. yeah. And you once know? it goes away, it goes away. And it's like that's that's not race I'm not having race for a couple of years and then having to like figure it out. Like James and I both were in the same spot at the same time and we like figured out something thanks to the dealership to go race <laughs> flat track. I tried racing yeah. flat track, but it was like you know, it was that kind of thing. It was like, I don't want to 
I don't want to do this or I don't want to sit behind a desk for the rest of my life. Yeah. And like literally just clawed back to where we are now. And it's the same kind of thing. Like even going into like the off season this year, I'm like, what am I going to do? Like if I, like I, I'm at the age, I'm almost 30. Right. So I'm like looking at it, like, I kind of want to do other stuff while I'm still young. And I have like the drive to put all that energy I've got into racing into something else. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, I don't really want to call it a day. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, cause once that stuff goes away, the curtain closes. It's, I, I think it's, it's tough too, cause you're still good. Like we're all still on the podium and whatever we like, do you know what I mean? Kids, yeah. different classes and whatnot, but we're all still on the podium. It's so hard to leave something you're good at. Yeah. yeah. Did you, did you have, you know, I think looking back at your resume, like the shy view is probably the closest you've come to pondering that. Have, have you had that kind of point in your career where you've been like, like, le- like stopping racing? Yeah. yeah. Never. I never like saw it as an option. Like even if I had to just work and do something to just, I'll, I'll never, I don't want to say I'll never, <laughs> but I've never understood. This is going to sound so bad, but like sp- going and working and then spending my money to go race. I've never like been able to like understand that. It's so gnarly to me that people spend so much money to come racing. Um, but there's never been a time in my life where I was like, I don't want to race. Like I always, I'm just like, I have to like just get through this year, do my best. And then something else will come. And I always like seem to like manifest what's going to happen. And it happens. Um, the shiby year and the mean years um, were so good for me to like have like, they were both great teams, but, but to get that like kind of like humble, like, like shit, I'm back at the, not the bottom, but the bottom of the top. Yeah, like right? where you were. Yeah, like uh, Amin's team was great, but it's the bottom of what it, you know, the options. Shybe's team was great. I love Shybe, but it was the bottom of the options. Same thing. And I also think maybe because you have perspective being at the top of the top. I mean, you were a factory rider since you literally came through the door. I mean, not a lot of people get that. They don't understand, even me, I've never been a factory rider. I've had great rides, but there's a level there that be riding for a factory and working with a motor company that when you have that, I mean, there is only down. Yeah. There isn't anything higher really, even though there could be better teams than the factory. Yeah. The factory is. So I think that pers- that perception and how, how do you kind of, how did you deal with that? Um, right. I think, I think I got lucky because I always had cool sponsors. Like I always put myself in a situation where I had some cool sponsors. And even if that team was not like everyone's first option, I made sure that I had like good guys working for me, like mechanics or whatever it was. And I always brought that like with Shibe, it's like I brought like a cool Alpine star set of leathers to the team. And I just feel like that sounds weird, but I feel like it makes it like seem more like, legit in a way like like okay like that's a step and then you get these sponsors with it it makes it look good then i talked shy into doing the swing arm and like stuff like that like we we got there like we were like three seconds off of a win at indy one year like that year with shy and i was like oh man like maybe this bike isn't as bad as i thought it was but you know and then the mean years it's like man i came back from from moto 2 i didn't have like no one like it was weird. I won the Superbike title in thirteen. Went to Moto Two in fourteen. Sucked. Came back. Went to Jersey. Like trying to find a ride. Gary Dean was my crew chief at Yamaha. He was working at a means team. Lined up a deal. Um, and I think I want to say like that weekend we ended up going to a strip club with the mean team. <laughs> And in Vineland, New Jersey, which I'm pretty sure there was like a fight outside and a gun was pulled. Like it was pretty nuts. I'm sure your chick was stoked about that too. <laughs> oh, I've been to a strip club with, oh, at that time, I think. Oh, we were on a break. <laughs> <laughs> we were on a break. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I went to, uh, yeah, we. Went to Jersey basically looking for a ride. And like I said, Gary was Gary was crew chief of Yamaha. So that was like one of my first options was to like go to Gary because I didn't have time to like mess around, like trying to figure out what I was going to do. I just needed to find something I knew was competitive. Jake Lewis was riding super sport on it in 14 and was fighting at the front. I'm like, all right, like if, if Jake can do it, like I can at least be doing what he's doing and be fighting for wins. And uh, yeah, I hung out with those guys and – 
I don't, yeah, when we went to a strip club that night and like kind of like got to know each other on a personal level. And I think Amin was at the time I did so bad. I, I don't even think I did so bad in Moto 2, but people put this image on me like I was just doing terrible. But then whenever like Bobier and Joe went over there their first couple of years, they realized how hard it is. But I was like, I'm, I've always been in my own head about things. And I was like, nobody wants me. Like I sucked. Nobody wants me. So I, I almost felt like that was my only option, like to go ask there. So that was the first team I asked and they wanted to do something. So I was like, all right, I'm doing it. I didn't even ask anybody else. And um, yeah, it ended up being one of the best decisions I think I ever made because it let me kind of like find myself in a way and feel like that underdog feeling that fight not like somebody was like not like I had the best and I like had to really fight for what I had and on the super sport bike it's a little bit easier because it's not there's not so much going on with the bike right like you don't have the electronics you do but it's very very minimal you don't have the crazy suspension you don't have the pivots and all that all the crap I don't I don't even know about but it's it's a lot simpler and it's more about just riding the bike hard. Um, and, and we were able to have some cool races and like the, I think the first race we did, we, we won. And I, I just, I felt so good that year. JD and girl off ended up beating me a, a ton of times that year. I made a, a couple dumb mistakes and, but it was just like racing became fun again. And like being, knowing what it's like to have people around you that, Everybody that's always ever been around me, they were always nice to me. I think they had me, you know, in their best interest. But when you go to a smaller team like that, it's like a family feel. And you you have fun with them. And you feel like they want to be there. Where sometimes the factory guys, like, it's a real job for them. They don't have another job at home where the guys on the smaller team, they go to the track to have fun. And the factory guys kind of lose that feeling. Where these guys are like, dude, I get to go to the races this weekend and we get to go try to win races yeah. and have fun. Yeah, That's yeah. why I like these like smaller teams because for me, like Bobby says, I need a cheerleader. And I think I do. Like I need, I need somebody, I need the whole team to like be behind me because if you're not behind me, why the fuck are you here? Like we're here to win races. We're here to have fun. I'll treat you like a brother as long as you treat me the same way. And I, yeah, I mean, like I'm not embarrassed to say that I do need that person. Like I need people behind me that are like, dude, you can do this. Like that's what racer doesn't need that. Like we're all kind of soft. Like we all like, we need that feeling. We grew up going to the races with our dad and our mom and family. And they all said that they yeah. all thought that. And then and kind of like living through you too. I think that's kind of the thing about a smaller team too, is like you're their lifeline, right? Because if you do shitty, then the team's just lucky yeah, enough to bummed. be there, right? Like, it's not, it's not, they're they're going to go away. Like, you know, if you don't perform, then the whole team going to... Yeah, like, I never thought about it like that. But yeah, I mean, like, because if you do bad, they're bummed. I, I want a team who, when I do bad, they're bummed. Yeah. yeah. But they're like, let's get them next time. Right. Like, yeah. What do you got to do when you get back? Like, Bobby just fat shaming me. Like, oh, you got to get skinny. <laughs> you got to get skinny. Because that made me in my head know... <laughs> Bobby wants to win. He wants me to win. Like, this isn't just like we didn't have another rider to put on the bike. Like, maybe at first it was, but then he maybe got in his head like we want him to win, right? But, yeah, those smaller teams like Amin, I did that for 15, 16, 17. And then um, even with Richard, I had that same feeling in 18 because we were, we were yeah. you know, we started out of his shop. He didn't have a team at the time. And then Shybe, like, it was it was a lot of that feeling, like just – like it was with my dad racing and you you don't get that when you're on bigger teams do you, do you think it was the first time i mean it really is the first time you went from factory 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 to moto 2 to like a small team you only really went to the yeah. top top and then straight down to like a usually ever that's where everybody starts yeah is in these family run teams and that's the f first time you ever did was what how many years were you on yamaha so, so six was me and my dad with factory yeah. support but seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen was like yeah salary big bonuses like so you knew yeah. nothing else yeah I didn't. you didn't know what it was like to besides having robots mm -mm. was there a difference in like pressure because like, not many people get to really compare that right is it was there a big difference in pressure from a factory level versus oh yeah. yeah yeah that's the best part because like 
if you get on the podium, they're stoked. And then if you win a race, they're like, holy shit, like we just, we just won a race. Like yeah. that's, but that's what racing is all about. Like when you're on these factory teams, they just expect you to win. And then it becomes a job where when we're on the smaller team, even like how we are now, like Bobby wants to win races, but it's still fun. And that's like what racing's all about. And that's what all these people get lost in is like, it's like, dude, we still finish on the podium. Like for me, if I get on the podium, I'm pumped. I don't care what anybody else tells me. Like I'm pumped. And sometimes like with the factory deal, it's like you let them bum you out. Cause you're like, yeah, it's oh. like third's not good enough. Yeah. It's like, like but crap. it is. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so I like that like smaller team feeling more like I would rather I haven't done it and I'm like when I look at you and I like there's times like I looked at you and Wyman I was like jealous because I I like that look of your own team and like being able to like like how James likes having the coffee cups and like all this stuff like I like having like Patrol I like that, that look yeah. right yeah and it's and then you get to choose who's on your team but you also have all the money and stress and all that stuff so that's not the side I'm jealous <laughs> of but it I just I like that smaller vibe like it's mm. it's real racing and it's uh it motivates you to do good because these guys that's not their full-time thing and they're just hungry and and happy to be there and and yeah the toxic guys you just get rid of and you know they they don't come back so yeah. um you you kind of said a few things about your dad being a little bit of like a hard hard ass and like what uh what was your relationship like with him from that perspective of like racing like how was he as a dad as you were kind of growing up, even as a kid, getting into it? He would, in my opinion, he was always awesome when it came to that. Like, you know, at a young age, like, I, I remember one year I just wanted to play baseball and basketball, and he's like, all right. Like, but then whenever I decided, like, oh, no, I miss racing. I want to come back. Um, and we didn't just totally leave, but it wasn't, like, serious, like, as in travel baseball or something like that, right? Like, we were dedicated to it. But he always told me, like, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it, and you have to be serious about it but I don't ever remember him really being like soccer dad type mm. thing. And that's like the biggest thing I hate about most parents I see. Like I always just try to tell them like, well, what can I do for my kids? Like just stop being that. Like right. don't, don't do that. Like just be there, have fun with your kid. Not only are we doing something dangerous and like we, we've all known people that at young ages have died and it's like, that's the saddest thing ever. Like, do you want like to be yelling at your kid the day before and then something like that happens like or whatever like first of all that should be your main thought second of all your kid's never going to perform as good as he should when you're sitting there doing that stuff um and third like you're going to have a shitty relationship when you're older because of it and um, I got lucky that my dad never did that you know the stuff with my ex like he I think that was more of a life thing than anything like he was just like don't make this stupid decision um and that's not to say that they didn't end up getting along okay later on in life, but like at first, yeah, it was it was bad. But he was never in racing. He never was like that. And even now, you know, he's just it's weird. He like <laughs> comes to the races, drives all over the country on his own dime. Still got a big bus. No, he's had like <laughs> five different ones. <laughs> like he just can't stop. I feel like that's every dad's dream. My dad was <laughs> saying we had big got, Phil. He still got his, yeah, right? yeah, they just got it running, dude. <laughs> and dude, like he was, he loved it. Yeah. That's like my dream is to be able to. Oh, it's not gonna, never gonna happen now, but to have made enough money to like just ha let my dad not work and just drive around a bit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I I wish I made enough money to just like like pay for my parents' house and let them come to the race. Like back in the day, like when I was sixteen, so my salary has never gone over uh one hundred and fifty k. It's like since I was sixteen to now, it's never gone above that. I've hustled and made more money because of other like. She brought sponsors in other sponsors or stuff like that. Endorsements. But from a team, it's never been over 150. Like when I was 16, it was like 100, it was somewhere around 100 to 150 or 17. Or no, I was still 16 when I got that deal. And then all the way until 2013, like it never went over 150 <laughs> because racing like was here and then yeah. went down and then back. It was always yeah. this weird thing, right? And um, so I never, like when I was, when I was young and starting, like, okay, when I was at Yosh, they found contracts from the Maladin days where he had made, and sorry if I'm wrong about this, this is just what I was told, but they added it up and they had, 
he had made somewhere between seven and ten million dollars in one year just from racing. I feel like I remember the, <laughs> those rumors going yeah, around. This is like con, like they found the contracts That's ten insane. years, fifteen years later, and like yeah. So like you were just on the you so you were still in the heyday for us. Yeah, but you just missed the heyday. Yeah, for your for. Them. So yeah, like Roger Hayden telling me or Zemke telling me like that they would make like a hundred thousand dollars a year from just leather companies or yeah. just maybe even more. I but. remember. Yeah, I think Roger <laughs> told me one time like Daytona was like two hundred fifty thousand or something from Cowie, Dude. and like Laguna was a hundred and fifty or something. Did you ever have bonuses like that? Yeah. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, like when I won. So bonuses, I. I never raced Superbike with crazy bonuses, but Supersport, I had the, the crazy bonuses. Because what was the Daytona 200 when you won? And you were, I think you were the, were you the youngest or just you were at second, the second time, youngest? Yeah, at the time I was the second youngest and the youngest, I forget what his name was, but it was on the sand. Yeah, I'm like, like come on. Yeah. <laughs> I heard the stat, I heard the stat come on. It's like 1955. <laughs> but when I won Daytona between like Yamaha, Red Bull, and like the smaller deals that I had, I think I made like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars that day or something. That's insane. Yeah, <laughs> well, I remember like cashing checks at the banks, and they're just like, like "What do you do? <laughs> Are you a drug dealer?" <laughs> That's so funny. Like, and then I, when when you go to a clerk and they like look at your bank, yes. and then they look at you and they go, "Yeah," they're like, "Wait a second, you're depositing twenty two thousand five hundred dollars from this same company every month, but why do you have sixty thousand dollars in the bank?" <laughs> Yeah. Like, what's wrong with you? Why are you spending so much money? You don't even pay rent. <laughs> what was that? What was the first thing you bought when you got that first, like, I mean, making 150K? I mean, obviously you're making big money then, but so like, having a bonus like that. When I won Daytona, I went out because in order to get the Rolex, you had to get pole. So I didn't get pole, but I won the race. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I'm not buying a Rolex, but I'm going to go buy a nice watch, which I'm pretty sure that my ex has which pisses me off so bad <laughs> but it was a tag hoyer <laughs> shit got pondered <laughs> it was like some tag hoyer watch with like a rubber band that like always had this vanilla scent on it and it was like 3500 bucks or something and i was like this is sick vanilla ice over <laughs> <here>. <laughs> it wasn't and it wasn't it was like very minimal looking right no like fake diamonds or anything like that but it was <clears throat> it was a cool watch and i felt so guilty i returned the watch and then I went and bought a mountain bike. It was my first mountain bike. I bought like a giant, I forget what it was called, but I went and bought my first mountain bike. I'm like, I'm going to start training. And I went into the mountain bike store and the bicycle guy happened to know who I was. And I was like, this is sick. Like it was like one of the first times that I really remember somebody like knowing who I was just at a random place. And then he like made me feel so good about Daytona that then I went and bought the watch back. So I bought the watch <laughs> and I bought, <laughs> bought it twice. Yeah, but I... I don't think I, I never bought like anything big and stupid. You want to know what like the dumbest thing that I ever did was, was hold on. Like, what, is this the, uh, should we break for that? Nah, okay. It's, right. it's probably not that crazy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I went and bought, so like my dad, like the same thing, like this RV thing, right? Like we did this like lease to own RV thing. We were paying like 3,500 bucks a month for this RV and oh, wow. plus the expenses of getting into the races, whatever. And this guy that we leased it from ended up being a Yamaha dealer. And his name was like Dick something. I forget what his last name was, but he owned a dealership in South Carolina. And this guy was a dick. Like we, <laughs> dude, we, we had this RV for like a year. Things just kept breaking on it, kept messing up on it. And the only thing that was wrong, my dad is so meticulous about everything he has. The only thing that happened was it had like a crack on the front window whenever we like agreed to return it to this guy. Something happened and the guy like agreed to come get it. And this is on my part, like just not handling situations correctly. But the guy ended up, not only did I had to put some crazy number towards it at the beginning, like $80,000 or something, but then he like sued us once we gave the RV back because he said there was so many damages to it. He sued me for $65,000. But I messed up with like something like he sued me from South Carolina and then I would have had to go to South Carolina to fight it. And like, I just ended up giving the guy the $65,000 because I had to, like, because I missed the court. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I was like young <laughs> and I'm just like, like, fuck this guy. Like on the check on the memo, I like, I put dick in the memo. <laughs> like I was so pissed. Should have called. I'll that. never forgive my dad for that because like, yeah. that was when I was kind of understanding money. And I'm like, this is because of you that I'm in this situation. And the only other thing was that. I ended up getting into a situation where like I had to basically pay for my ex's house 
and I had at least two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars into that house. And like when I left, I just left, and I didn't get any of it. And well, yeah, just live and learn. But yeah, one eight hundred Law Sh- Tigers. Should have called Law Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> Could have got you out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, so I mean, it, obviously, you made a good amount of money in your in your career. Do you think throughout the years, like, or even now, as if you look back on it and kind of wish you'd done things differently with your with your money and invested in other things? Oh like, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, because Rachel's smart with money and like she handles all of our, our, which we have accountants, but she handles handles all the tax, like, you know, separating everything and just, she handles all that stuff. And she's like, now we're buying a house for the first time. That's, you know, I built with my dad the house in Dublin, but it cost us like 40,000 bucks to build our house because my dad built it. And it was more of like an apartment set up with a garage under it. Um, but yeah, especially now that I'm with her and, and that we have a son, like, I've, yeah, of course, because the amount of money that I made, I should have been, never had to worry about money in my life again. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll always regret it. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, you, you can't do anything. Is. I could have, I could have died 10 years ago and yeah. then what, like, it, it yeah. doesn't matter anyways. Like, can't you, take it with you, right? <laughs> you need money to survive. But now the only reason that I wish I made more money is because, like my kid would just I'm not going to give him all the money one day but it would have been nice to just have investments and like made it to where he had some you know some help Start when he's older up, yeah. So. yeah how much is having a kid change your perspective or even just like your approach when it comes to racing so much like <laughs> I, I, I always wanted a kid but I just was lucky that I knew not even that I knew it just I got lucky that I didn't I didn't have a son or a kid earlier I got very lucky um, I, everybody, like I grew up like with faster, right? Like you, or even just in racing, people were like, when you have a girlfriend, you slow down. When you have kids, you slow down. When you get married, you slow down. Like in faster, Colin Edwards said like, oh, when I, when I, I forget what his, his wife's name is. Um, I feel bad, but Colin Edwards, you know, whenever he started dating her, he's like, he said something like, oh, I got a half second quicker. When I got married, I got quicker. And when I had a kid, I got quicker. I had my second kid, I got quicker. And I was like, always like, that's, that's cool. And like in 2008, my family built the Heron compound or middle Georgia cart track at the time. And they, at some point, whenever I, I forget what year it was, but whenever I came back to Georgia, Aaron Yates had started coming to the track and Ashton Yates was, would start riding there. Like he started, I think he went to like Barnesville cart track before, but he was very young. Like, I don't know how old he was, but he was young and he was coming, you know, to the track. And so I, we became good friends with them and, and kind of would go to their house, see family photos of like Aaron with Ashton on the podium and all this stuff. And that like really, I think in the back of my mind was like, I want that someday. I want to be racing when I have a kid so I can bring him on the podium and do those things. And yeah, Griffin being born was like the biggest motivation for me ever. Um, not only because I wanted to make money to give him a good life, but I just, it was it's so fun having him and Rachel at the races and like he's obviously so young that it's hard to tell if he understands what's going on but he's all he'll be two in September and every bike he sees is dada and he watches the tv and he knows like Rachel will send me videos if they don't come to a race and when my bike goes by he says dada I'm like yeah it's the it's the best thing in the world and being on the team that I'm on right now with him there having Farachi and Bobby and the Denaples, like they're all just like such, they're so close with him. It, yeah, it's the best feeling in the world. And I'm so happy that he's, it just happened so perfectly. And it was like almost like a restart to my career again, which I've had so many of those, but it was a good restart. Like, all right, this year Griffin's coming to the races, like we're a new team. And it's been the first time in years that I've been on a team for two years in a row and like seeing the whole team like gel with Griffin the next year and be really close with him is yeah, it's, it's the best man. And, and, um, when, whenever Griffin was really young and people were asking about a lot, it was like so easy to explain the feelings, but you know, as he's around longer, it's like the relationship changes into different things with him. And you kind of forget how lucky you are still to have him at the races because he gets harder at the races and you see Rachel like, struggling she can't come in hot pit she's got to stay on the other side of the fence that whole relationship of the races changes because she would she went from like taking care of me at the races to now she has to take care of griffin and i'm like having to do it on my own and 
and it's it changes right but but it's uh really it's full circle because now I'm in the position that I was when I was a kid and watching my dad race and it's wild like you you never experience anything like it and it's having having a son is the best feeling like being a parent is the best feeling in the world before that it was racing and getting married but now that I'm able to be married have a son at the races and be winning races is like you got it all it's like a jackpot like it's <laughs> it really is like the best thing in the world and and I'll, I'll yeah I'm so lucky to get to experience that like now when you say you you kind of mentioned that you feel like everything kind of happens for a reason mm -hmm. <clears throat> when you look back like I've kind of noticed there's like I don't know, three Josh Aarons, right? There was when we did the GoPro deal. Yeah. It was kind of a little bit, I don't know what the word is. I'm going to say a little bit immature, yeah. like young. Then he went through <laughs> kind of like Crazy Heron, Hooligan, Coors Light, like big social media, whatever. And then now to like Dad Heron. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's super more mature, total different. When you look back, do you think like you needed to go through all that? And do you, do you like, how does that... Um, I, I think, yeah. do you think you've changed? No. <laughs> okay. I think I'm the same. <laughs> I mean, I, I just can't do as many things because, because Griffin's there, but like, I mean, me and Rachel took my mom and the whole Yosh team to a strip club after Barbara. Like, it's just like, I'm still that guy. Like <laughs> we went to a strip club okay. that night. Like <laughs> we had midgets coming up <laughs> asking us if we wanted to buy drugs from them. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't do any of that while, like, like yeah. I've never okay. done drugs, but like, I still like have fun and yeah. like do two fun. I don't know if you can use that part or not, but it's, we uh, use it all, man. <laughs> this is live. It's, um, doing it live. Yeah, I'm still that person. I mean, okay. it's, I'm just, different obviously i'm raising a son now and yeah I'm, it's not like i'm bringing my son to a strip club but yeah <laughs> it's, uh, not yet what what do you <laughs> like what kind of prompt that whole like social media i just you think the core is like because you sorry have short people short people yeah. not yeah i shouldn't have said that you that was the only wrong thing i said there <laughs> you had like the core's light logo did they ever come for you for that no um and like what was is everything like was anything planned, like drinking a beer on corkscrew or anything? Was that planned? No, <laughs> so everything's just like off the off the cuff. Yeah, that that just, just happened. You. Like that was that was such a cool moment. But I wish I would have like sat there and drank the beer because I just kind of was so pissed but so stoked at the same time that I just like drank a little bit of it and left. I, I should have just sat there and hung out because that was so cool. But yeah, nothing's ever been planned. But a lot of like the ideas I've had over the years that have like turned into something cool was honestly like always Rachel or John John, my, my wife, my buddy, um, like the Coors Light thing. I, I have such a bad memory that a lot of it, um, if you bring stuff up, like, yeah, that was probably John John's idea or that was probably Rachel's idea. But it, I just am the type of person that always like acts on it. Like, okay, yeah, I want to do it. Like, screw it. I'll do it. The Coors Light thing, all the, the hooligan stuff, like it all happened because of somebody else. Like when I, when I started doing like the wheelies on the street and backing it in stuff, that was because this guy a day um, out in California who's a kind of like influencer guy and then my video guy now, Lanky, they were doing videos together and they asked me to come out and do a video just just like talking and riding on the street. And I was like, uh, I guess so. Like I had just got my R1S from Yamaha and I, I, don't, I don't know if I had started. I may have like posted a couple videos in Georgia just like, flying by like my sister filming in a truck or doing like a burnout or something but I wasn't known for like street stuff and they just sat me down and did like an interview and we rode and I just was like man this is so fun like I was in my leathers and I felt like Superman like we were we were like racing in the canyon in the video like we knew like there was no cars like we would look and yeah. I'd done like shoots with like helmet companies and stuff before where we did stuff in the cans. So I knew like what to look for. Like, okay, there's no car coming for a while. And then Nick would be at the other end and radio to us, like, yeah, you're clear, stuff like that. But yeah, it always, it always was because like I, somebody asked me to do something or somebody thought of something and I just did it. I'm like, yeah, sure. I never like thought about like what might happen if I post this or what might happen if I make this shirt or whatever. But people always, since 2017, to now it's like my life has been so cool because of social media and like 
the Coors Light stuff and the street stuff, but people always just get so angry at me. Like, they like, just get mad. I can't, you can't be doing stuff like that. Like Yamaha, I met the marketing guys at Yamaha, Martin, at the time, and Martin Vivanco and Matt LaPaglia. And they were like, okay, we're going to do this, like, R1S with you, but we're going to do it through marketing. So racing can't say anything about it. And we're not going to, like, we're just going to give you the bike and it's going to be in your name and we have nothing to do with you anymore. So you just do whatever you want to do. And that was like the best. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm, I just went for it. I started doing, I mean, I, and I don't do it because obviously I post it and I have fun with it on social media, but that's like what I have fun doing. Like racing to me is so stressful sometimes that that street stuff is like my kind of release. It's almost like when you see rocks in racing and then, and I'm sorry if I'm not trying to compare myself to rocks and I know that he's godlike but like he races but then you see him sometimes like he started getting in like with tyler berriman doing like the freestyle jumps and you see this like i saw a clip of berriman he's like i guarantee you he's gonna have the best weekend he's had all year after they rocks and did this like 160 foot jump and then he went out and like won and it was this year on the suzuki i think and stuff like that like that's what it does for me it's like this release of like the adrenaline or something that i don't get in racing anymore or maybe I never got, I don't know, but it does something for me that then like, just, I have so much fun doing that, that then racing is fun again. And it's not so much like I'm so stressed about winning. Um, but I just am always getting in trouble and like people, people that like on the outside looking in, like they just, they, they're like, you're ruining the image for racing and like all this stuff. And I'm like, dude, like, racers are supposed to be the guys that you don't want to bring home to meet your parents. Like, that's what we're supposed to be. Like, if you look back in history, like, motorcycle racers, motorcycle riders, like, nobody likes them. And you're supposed to, I'm not saying that I want to be that image, but, like, let's not act like we're, like, tennis players right now. Like, what, yeah. golfers. I don't know what they want us to be like, but this is not what we are. And because of, <laughs> no offense to your sponsor, but because of lawyers and this whole suing thing, like, all manufacturers are so afraid to let somebody like go to a wheelie on the road and be like part of their brand doing wheelies because then somebody might do it and then get hurt and then sue them because Josh Heron did it. Like, and that it sucks because it's like, why can't you just, I just want to be myself. Like, leave me alone. I'm just posting this cause it's fun. I, I like doing it. Like everybody's always like, don't post what you post like for attention, post it because you like doing it. And that's what the street stuff is for me. And my racing content doesn't do any good anyways. It's my street stuff. And that's because I think it's because what I have fun doing and I seem natural when I'm doing that. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you think that you have any kind of responsibility as like being the, the you know, kind of like what I said, I'm being like the face of American motorcycle racing. People look to you, kids coming up, you know, like Rocco Landers or you know, Gus Rodeo, like these kids coming up, they kind of look to you as like the gauge of, what works, what doesn't work, because obviously you've been successful for a long time. Do you do you feel a responsibility for that at all? Um, like sometimes, yeah. I mean, but I think my responsibility in that sense of it is like to be a good person, to respect my competitors, um, to teach them maybe things that I've learned, like like I talk about all the time, like Ben Bostrom when I was a kid, when we were teammates told me like one day you're not going to be able to win races and you need to be able to make money doing something else. So if you're good at marketing and fans like you, you'll get rides for longer. And there's been times where people were like, why the fuck would you put that guy on this bike? And I'd like to hope I prove them wrong on the trap track, but also it's maybe because I could make sponsors money and other riders couldn't, or I had long lines at the fan walks and other riders didn't, or whatever it is, it, it ended up, like he taught me a lot and that if, if he taught me anything, that was the most important thing that he taught me. So if somebody's, you know, I just look at it like this from the time you're five years old, you're watching movies, you're listening to music, you're getting inspiration from like all these things in your life. You're playing these video games where everybody kills each other. If, if somebody wants to point a finger at me because I'm riding a motorcycle on the street and doing a wheelie, then they, they better, not be letting their kid watch any movies at home. They better not let them play any video games. They better not let them listen to any music. They better not let them go to school and talk to the kids at school and have them teach them about all the things that they teach them because their parents don't pay attention to what they're learning. Like, 
I'm riding a motorcycle on the street and doing wheelie, which is everybody does that. Yeah. I don't know one guy that rides a bike on the street that hasn't sped, that hasn't done a wheelie. None of them. Even the guys that yell at me for doing it, they've done it. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I do feel a responsibility, but I think in other ways. Um, do you think you do a, a good job at, at, I guess, fulfilling that responsibility in those other ways? Because, like, you know, I think that's the problem with social media is you are what you post. Yeah. Right. So well, people gasoline. see you, people see you drinking a beer in the corkscrew and people see you doing wheelies. And then it's kind of like, well, Josh is just one of these dicks that drinks beer and, <laughs> and, and does wheelies and burnouts on the street. And that's kind of like all of a sudden that's who you become, maybe not internally, but externally to the people that see you on social media. Do you ever, do you ever think about the ways to fill what you feel is your responsibility? And like, do you, do you think you do a good job at that? Um, I would think so. And I know that there's situations that I've been in where people would argue that, you know, like somebody would be like, oh, you you respect your competitors, but you run into other riders or whatever it is. But people have gotten soft on that, too, because it's like this is racing. Like we like you're flat tracker. I don't know if you have you flat. You're you didn't grow up. Yeah, baby, this guy wasn't in it. I mean, you guys are flat trackers are racing with no I mean, maybe now. But even now I watch some and it's like just hay bells like it used to be. Like it's not like it's like some super safe thing and they're banging off of each other. Like that's what I've known road racing as. And like especially when I went to Moto2, like I got even more aggressive. Not like I want to take this guy out, but you just get aggressive. And I think that's the only thing that people really like complain about me is that like, oh, you remember when you took this guy out or you took that guy out? And it's like, okay, first of all, like – I'm on TV every time I race. So every mistake that I make, yeah, you see it and then you're just going to hate on me for it. But I'm just, there's two things that I'm doing. I'm pushing the limits because I want to win. But I also like, I'm not saying that I, (laughs) that I've, you know, crashed into another rider to put on a show, but I make passes because I think about not just winning the race. I think about like the guy at home that's watching a race and he's, you know, Maybe his wife's in the background. And this is so weird. I think about, I do think about this during racing, like, and maybe not into this much detail, but like his wife's in the background, like, we got to go, we got to go. And he's, you know, he's like, oh, my race is on. But if the race is boring, he's just going to go home or he's going to leave or he's going to change the channel. But if it's six laps in, seven laps in, and Heron's like making passes and trying to be exciting, maybe he'll be like, fuck off. I'm watching my race. (laughs) Like, yeah. Right. Like, I try to think about those things because I think about not just, like me making money or the race or the team i think about the show and like if moto america or whatever it is is gonna like keep growing like we need to do stuff like that in order for a racing to be entertaining because i couldn't tell you about certain races that some dude just won or like this is the top three and nothing happened in the race but whenever you think of you know battles or somebody crashed into somebody else like that's the stuff you talk about like i think about yeah, just all kinds of stuff. Like even Supercross, like Osborne in Vegas, like going. I forget the rider he went up the inside of, but like just taking him out on the last turn, last lap. Was that Savachi? Maybe I don't what know. Was that? I don't remember. I remember. I know what you're talking about for the like championship. That, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. like that gets remembered. Yeah, yeah. Why? Why? Nobody cares about races that just somebody like that. The boring races. Like I want to put on a show. Like this is an entertainment sport. Like we need to bring that value to people in order for them to like keep watching. So that's why I'm aggressive on the track on top of I want to win. And like I bring this up lately. It's like if you're if you're in a race, it's the same as a boxing match. You have however many rounds you have. We have so many laps. Are you just going to stand there and dance around the ring and not hit your opponent and not try to weaken him for the last round so that you can have a better chance of, you know, beating him? I want to wear the guy out and pass him in turn three, turn five, turn six, turn seven. Like, I want to pass him everywhere. I want to pass him where he'll never expect it. I want to pass him where he thinks he's so strong you could never go up the inside of him. But maybe I can't make a clean pass, but I'm going to go up the inside of him and run both of us wide because guess what? It gets their heart rate up. It gets them panicking. It gets them thinking like, dude, if he's behind me, how am I going to win this race? All that stuff. So those are the things that people sitting at home, even if they're a weir racer, AFM, or they don't race and they just ride in the street, they don't think about all that stuff. And this is my job, and I've been doing it for longer than anybody except for Hayes in the paddock right now. And these are the things that have made me be able to get paid doing this for 18 years, which is longer than almost any racer in the world can say they've been paid to race a motorcycle. So it's, I've done something that's 
all right at it to where I can keep doing it. So that's like my answer to the people who hate. <laughs> but going back to like the, you know, being an inspiration or like having, being a good, somebody good to look up to, like, I like to think that I am. I mean, I, there's things that, that I do that some people don't agree with, but I would say that 90% of people are okay with it. And, um, you know, like I've been with Fresh and Lean for a few years. We, we did a contest where we brought three kids to the mini cup and, and paid for their whole trip, paid for them to get bikes to ride there, like stuff like that. Like, I, I think I do a lot of things that a lot of people maybe don't know about or like, you know, whenever we had the Heron compound, like just giving bikes away or giving helmets away or just like trying to be that person, um, putting on rides in California on the street to get people into racing. And, and what people don't understand about me posting the street content also is let's say 7 million people watch these videos. Don't you think that there may be 10% of them or may, even if it's 1% of 7 million people, you're a real estate agent, you know how much 1% gets you. It's, like, it's a lot of people that end up looking at racing and then they're like, oh, I want to check that out. Like, so I think, I think, I, I think about most of the things that I do and I don't just do it to be an idiot. Like I, I strategically reached out to OnlyFans not just because I wanted to make good money, but because I know that people are going to pay attention to that logo on my helmet and that in turn my sponsors are going to be happy because when there's a video of a drag race that gets seven, eight million views on YouTube and then in the comments it's just people talking about OnlyFans, well, guess what? They're looking at the helmet, they're looking at a ride, they're looking at Fresh and Lean, they're looking at Alpine Stars, like it's all this stuff that I, I strategically like try to think about all that. I don't just do it because like I want to be controversial and people hate me. <laughs> I just do it because I'm like, all right, 10% of people are going to hate me, but 90% of the thing it's awesome. And all press is good press is the way that I look at everything. So unless you're doing something really bad, <laughs> then yeah. it's not good. <laughs> well, so with that in mind, if you take all that away from it, would you still do the same stuff? Like if, if the visibility, if the sponsors, all that went away and it was like, I just want to post videos of me riding on the street and you had 10 followers on Instagram, would you still be posting it? Or is it mostly motivated by the fact that you're really good at marketing and understand the value I, of all that stuff? I wouldn't post anything on social media if I didn't have like a reason to be doing it. I'm not going to just post it. Be, like I'll just send it in a text to my buddies or look at it, right? Like every everybody in the world posts to social media because they want the attention they like reading the comments they like reading the messages N anybody that doesn't do that they're lying i think and you know it just makes us feel good it's like a dopamine yeah it's and it, yeah. i would be doing the same things would i be if i had 10 followers like may, maybe okay I, I, like there's guys that i know that they ride on the street with me and they yeah. had 10 followers they end up getting 150,000 followers by doing the same thing so there's always like a motivation at some angle um, I just, but I was, I was around before social media, right? Like yeah. well, I was racing professionally before social media came around and you know, it was, just, was I doing it then? No, but I also like, wasn't, I did, wasn't at that point in my life where like, that's what I had fun doing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd be doing the same thing, but I wouldn't be posting it. And yeah. if, if I was, then it would just be. I'd probably honestly like make some character and do it like that. Yeah. I guess I, I ask because I think people tend to think of it or look at you and be like, well, he's just leaning into this stuff because it, it brings yeah. more clicks. It brings more views. And that's why I ask oh. like, is it still something you would do or would not do based on that? You I know, think I'd just be doing it for somebody else. Like if I wasn't doing it for my stuff, I would want to be doing like, like not a manager, but like a, content manager because like you you know you're I think you guys have that same kind of like mindset like I look at things riders like like even Skoltz I'm so mad at Skoltz because I reached out to him before Daytona and I'm like hey uh are you gonna have a sponsor on your helmet this year and he's he claims that he doesn't I have a wrong number but whatever I wrote him on social media too but I was like this guy never has a logo on his helmet I want to make him money like I love like trying to like come up with ideas to make somebody make more money in racing yeah. or be better or Cause like it wouldn't have been one of my sponsors, but maybe I reached out to somebody that couldn't afford what I needed. And I had somebody that could have been on his helmet, but he missed out on it. Like I, I like, I love the idea of like running a race team, owning a race team, a, sh a motorcycle shop, like just something like that. And social media is just so interesting to me. And it nowadays it's, it's a little bit weird. 
because I feel like anybody can just be somebody on there, which is cool. Like, I like that people have their ability to like be creative and do things, but it has taken away from like that, like feeling cool on social media because you're an athlete or you're yeah. whatever it is. Like, cause before it's like, Oh, we're on TV, but now nobody really cares about TV. They just care about social media. And this guy has 200,000 followers, just like you have 200,000 followers. So like what sets you apart? Right. This guy doesn't ask us for any money to sponsor him, but you're asking for 50 grand. Like, what, yeah. what's going yeah. on here? Yeah. Makes it a lot harder business wise. I think all that stuff's interesting. I think people need to hear it because it does, it gives you a little bit more depth to like what your thought process is behind some of this stuff. And um, I think, I think it's interesting. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. I think, and social media has changed within the last five years of how fast the content comes. Like, we're, you know, having a video guy and you got to have, it's pretty much everything now, but, like long form, even a minute cool edit is just like useless. It's, it isn't, it isn't, but they have, but it is like, yeah, it's useless. Better off with a 10 second, clip 10 second little. Stuff. Yeah. And then now it's like, even iPhone videos are doing better than, you know, full production. So it's like, it's, it's very a weird marketplace right now. And, um, the cool thing is that you have a sponsor that's so far outside the industry, which we need. We need relatable sponsors to the average person that can get drug in well. Like it's I think that's what's Sorry. probably the coolest thing about the OnlyFans deal. And it uh, what it does is it raises the value of everybody else who's on you. Yeah. Right. I think right now is a good time since we're talking about the crazy the crazy street stuff. Um our friends at, at Law Tigers are offering a, a free get out of jail free card uh for your for your wildest wildest story. If you're willing to share something with us, <laughs> oh, for me, yeah, yeah, from you. What's uh, what's some of the what's some of the craziest thing, or what what is the craziest thing from your career that you've experienced or or gotten Cra- away with? Oh, just in general, just crazy, in general. Anything. Like craziest just moment, anything about motorcycles, though. Whatever, whatever. It is. Maybe maybe you got caught at a strip club and and violent and <laughs> got beat up <laughs> yeah. by the bouncer or something. Oh man, <laughs> put me on the spot here. I don't know. Or even just, uh, just... I have a cool story, like something that I did get lucky, like with with like the law, if you want to say that. Well, that's um, you, this is your get out of free. It? It's your get out of free jail card. <laughs> it was like 2000. I was on a means team. I want to say it was 2015. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It was on 600. So yeah, 2015 barber. I want to say it was the last race of the year. I don't. I don't remember for sure. I'm pretty sure it was. We we finished the weekend. We're the last truck in the paddock and me and, you know, Keaton. Um, so me and Keaton, he was my mechanic. We leave in my F-150 and I think Johnny B was driving the truck. So he's like going to leave and it's literally just us three at the track. No one else was there. I don't know why we were so late, but whatever. We leave, we go up to the skid pad on like the second or third row, whatever that is, the tier at Barber. And I'm just like, oh, I'm going to try to do a burnout or like a donut or whatever. <laughs> and so I like do a donut and we're like laughing like, the fuck, yeah, that was sick. <laughs> and we leave. And then next thing I know, I like as I get to the top of the paddock, I make a left to like leave the track. And there's like a, <laughs> like one of the smart cars with the lights on, like a cop car <laughs> chasing us. And I'm just like, what the fuck? <laughs> It was like you're just looking in the mirror, smart cars chasing you with lights on. Like this is just like what the fuck's going on right yeah. now? And I'm like, Keaton's like, go. I'm like, all right. So I just go, and we're like hauling ass. I'm like, we're about to be to the front, and they fucking had shut the gates on us. Like literally locked. They like somebody. He obviously radio. He's like, close the gates, and they close the gates. I'm like, threw a spike strip down. Well, basically, <laughs> like I felt like I was in Grand Theft Auto. I'm just like, oh my god. So. We get to the gate, and I don't know the guy's name, but he's been, like, the the maintenance guy there or security for a long time. He's, like, super tan, like, kind of lighter hair, smoked cigarette, wearing a hat. And he's he knows who I am because I've been going there since 2004, and this is 2015. And he's like, what are you doing? And he he's like, pull over out here. I got I to gotta call the sheriff. And I'm just like, fuck. He's like, he's like this, is, this is bad. This is bad. So we, we pull over and I'm like, fuck, like I had a suspended license (laughs) because I had missed the court date. Oh no. I literally had just got arrested because I was driving to the lake with my family we were pulling my boat and I got pulled over and then all of a sudden the guy put me in cuffs. He's like, get out, put me in cuffs. I'm like, what the fuck? 
And it ends up being that I just missed a court date and they suspended my license. So my dad bails me out. It wasn't like I went to jail for something bad. It was literally for a speeding ticket or something. So I'm like, oh, my God, I still haven't fixed my license. I'm like, Keaton, I'm like, you got to switch seats. <laughs> he was, he was like, are you kidding me? I'm like, dude, do you want me to go to jail right now? Like, you got to switch seats with me. He's like, no, I'm like, bro, come on. Get, just switch me. We're not going to, nothing's going to happen. Just, I'll get us out of this. Just switch seats. Like, Fuck. So like when the guy's not looking, he already knew who was driving, <laughs> but he switches seats with me because when the cop gets there, he doesn't know. Yeah. So he switches seats, sheriff gets there, pulls us out. He thinks Keaton's driving now. He's like just wrecked, like lecturing him, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like the buddy that was just there. Like, oh, it wasn't me. Oh, man, this just reminded me I have an even worse story. <laughs> um, so he's like, oh, I could get you for um, like criminal trespassing, uh, damage to private property. Like you could go to jail for like, dude, he said some crazy number, like five years or something <laughs> like that. And I'm like. Dude, no. I'm not trespassing. We were invited here. I raced today. I think I won the race, like, or whatever. I got on the podium. Like, I've known these guys forever. I was on a skid pad, or like, I think I just, at the time I was like, we were, on, we were on a skid pad. And he's like, the guy was so pissed. He's like, that's a fucking wet skid pad. You can't go on it with no water on it. You're going to damage it. <laughs> and dude just lectured us and like made us think he was going to arrest us. And then they were like, all right, I talked to Mr. Barber, and he's going to let you go. And, like, but I thought for sure we were getting arrested, and, like, <laughs> my name was going to be all over Road Racing World. Oh, I would have, they would have loved that, too. <laughs> or, Old J.U. Dude, Superbike Planet would have been, like, oh, 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 oh my God. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he let us go. And, yeah, that was, oh, man, I got lucky, because that could have been, I don't know. I'd, the biggest thing was I just looked like an asshole for doing that. But it, as a racer, like it's a skid pad. Like yeah. A, yeah. I don't know. And it just got blown out of proportion yeah. with suspended license and getting in handcuffs. You know, yeah. you, you'd you have been like this. Yeah. Like, oh, whatever, hold <laughs> the card. Good ones for, uh, for our law tigers. Get a jail-free card. Just Thanks remember. those guys. Yeah. Remember, if you are or you know somebody that's in an accident, please call 1-800-LAW-TIGERS. They will help you out. Um, make sure that your second call after 911. They, no charge either, right? If you're, if they represent. Yep, you? yep. There's no charge to you, um, and they'll just sort everything out and call Law Tigers. Tank's got your back here. He's got a six pack. So, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, back to uh, back to the other stuff. So you know, you said you were trying to help out Maddie with that. What um, I I kind of feel the same way about a few of the dudes in the paddock who like got nothing on their helmets, no stickers. Like it's like, like even I, if, I don't get it. It's like it's even if a, you put something on there to then upsell. Yeah, You know, like it doesn't, I mean, I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, I need X amount of dollars, but even starting small, I remember my monster deal with Alex and I mean, my first monster helmet was essentially free and it was middle of the season and they just showed up with it. And I was just like, I was trying to go through monster army and this and the other, but it ended up leading to money. And then because I had monster, I was able to just get money. It was like the, the gate opened yeah. and I, I feel like a lot of people, even if you don't have anything finding a local sponsor or something just to have some sort of cool logo mm -hmm. and to even get a cool helmet design. I was always about getting a cool helmet design that looked different to where people were like, all right, even if they just paid for the helmet design, it gets you somewhere. And yeah. I just feel like it's gotten lost, especially for maybe not super bike riders, but younger and lower categories, like even in junior cup and things of that nature. I feel like slapping stickers is kind of the thing right now. It's like, just slapping stickers. I feel like if you can kind of just put a little bit more effort in, a little bit more, but yeah, yeah I, I, I'm kind of with you on that. It's it's a tough one. It's um, like for me, <clears throat> growing up in, uh, you know, with a factory ride, it's like your, your only option to like make more money was your helmet because we owned our helmet. So we weren't allowed to put logos on the bike, leathers ever. So it was hard for me for a long time to like, I just... I was lucky and was making good money, so I didn't think about like, oh, I need to make another twenty grand or whatever, because it just it was the amount of work that went into it, and it just at the time I was like didn't think about it. But Amin was actually the first. I had ran some like little logos on my helmet before, but Amin was the first one that like was like, hey, do you want to run this logo on your visor? I think it was Galfer for you know I'll give you this much money. I think it was like five thousand bucks or seven thousand bucks. I don't know. I'm like sweet yeah that's all i gotta do just put it on my visor he's like yeah i'm like all right cool and 
then it kind of like opened my eyes. I'm like, wow, like I could do a lot of, and I, I knew even with sponsors are like, if the logo's on the bike, I always saw like all these people that were like, oh, I could put your logo on this, you know, put it right here. But it's not like NASCAR where like we have this giant logo. It's like nobody sees, even the biggest logos on yeah, the bike, you don't, you see, don't them. see them. So you have to do more. You have to like, but it's not just on you. It should be on the company that's sponsoring you as well. Like this needs to be a relationship where I put the logo on my helmet I'll post about it. I'll do try to come up with like creative ways to, to do things, funny things to say on the podium to where people talk about it. But you guys need to like do your part on like kind of getting creative also. It can't just be like you give me the money, I do all this cool stuff or try to because it doesn't work like yeah. that. It's got to be a relationship. You yeah. guys got to do it together. Got to activate. Yeah, nobody nobody really like thinks they I don't know. I don't see that actually like the whole thing working a lot. But it also boils down to like having sponsors that are fun to promote. Like it's you can't you can't like promote a company well unless you actually like think it's funny or you you really love the product or you there's just gotta be like motivation behind it. You can't mm-hmm. just be like, um, I don't know, I'm trying like even motorcycle parts are like hard to do because it's not really like that. I don't know, for us it's it's like, yeah. okay, like we all need them. There's 20 different companies, like whatever. I don't know. I felt like you did a good job when you rode for Attack. I feel like you were pretty creative with that and yeah. selling parts and throwing in giveaways. and. Yeah, but then I also like looked at the numbers too much, and I'm like, oh, it only got 1,000 likes. Like I don't want to oh, do yeah. it. But then the more that I like, you know, obviously we all watch videos, but I realized at a point where even now I'm kind of, I've gotten back into that and I'm like, because reels popped off so much that I'm like, if I don't see 20,000 likes on something, I'm like, what happened? Yeah. Why did I only get 3,000 likes on this? And it's so pathetic. Like it really is that we think that way, but it just, we get stuck in that. Um, but Wiener Schnitzel was like the first like good example of like why, um, you know, not worrying so much about how much money that I got for doing it the first year mattered. It was kind of like a, um, oh, I can't think of who I'm thinking of, but you know, let me, let me prove to you that I can. Oh, okay. I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know if you'll know, but, um, why not ride mm-hmm. the Zach and I forget what his last name is. I've been talking to him and I see him, you know, there's stuff like a lot of racers. They think this guy's like corny as hell. Because he is. Like, he posts stuff that's just, like, super corny. Um, but now he's coming in. He's filming with um, Michael. Is it Michael Haynow? Is that his first name, Michael? Yeah, I think so. I know the, the Haynow name. Okay, Haynow. And so he's coming to the Moto America race and kind of, like, learning about racing. And I've been talking to him now maybe since, like, March or something like that. I've followed him for a little while, but I started talking to him then. But I do see him posting this stuff about, like, he's working with a certain helmet company now and – he was saying um, that, so they were going to like do 10 ambassadors for this helmet company, right? And he's like, I had so many people ask me, how much is it paying? Like that was the first thing they asked. And he basically was like, yeah, we're not working with these people. Even doesn't matter how big they were, I'm not picking these people. And we all get stuck in that. And I, I for sure do, because especially like if you get it, I'm not going to say who or when it was, but if you get $150,000, $200,000 deal to do something, you think you're worth that and you don't want to go back to that. You're not going to do something for free. But like when I signed with Wiener Stencil, it was for like 2,500 bucks or sorry, let me don't jump around. So he's, he's big on not like, he wants you to prove your worth to a company. And if you're good enough, then they're going to do something with you. And it sometimes more than not, it works that way. But a lot of times if you don't do a good enough job, it's not going to work that way. Or even right. if you do, they might just be like, well, we gave you this much last year. We're not giving it, you know, we're not going to give you 10 times that. You got to over deliver. Yeah. But most of the times, like, so now I'll go to Wiener Sense Hall. Like I begged at the time I didn't know him, but it, his name's Rico. I begged him and begged him, like, put me on, put me on, put me on. And if you're not from California, you don't really know what Wiener Sense is, but it's a big, like, just super bad for you, chili hot dog, like total opposite of fresh and lean, but it was funny. And like, I could talk about wieners and I think that's hilarious and all this stuff. Right. So I'm like, just let me, let me do it. And the first weekend I rolled out with wieners. And so I think it was road America and Greg white and Pridmore probably said wieners since like 50 times on the, <laughs> on the, like during the race. Yeah. 
And I remember like I put like just big old hot dogs on my helmet and like I just had fun with it. And I told Rico, I said, let me just do this. And then if you're not happy, just give me what you can. If you're not happy next year, then whatever. And I ended up probably, I don't even know how what the most was I ever got from them. It wasn't like monster money or anything, but it was it was good money to run to run just stickers on the helmet. And fans ate it up. Like they they just loved it. And so then in turn, you know, ends up getting other deals or you you know, especially deals like that, you meet other people. Um, like scrub blade wipers. I did deal with scrub blade wipers, which is their buddy. And because of this Baja thing that we did and, you know, it just ends up opening doors. And, um, if you, if you know your worth and your value, like it's okay, as long as you can afford it to like do something for small and then hope for something bigger if you do a good job. And if they're not willing to, you know, you know, you scratch their back, they scratch yours. If they're not willing to do it the next year, then you just go to somebody else. But nine times out of 10 for me, it ends up working that way. And I think it's important to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the biggest problem with the motorcycle industry. And that's why it's like, it hasn't really, and motorcycle industry is always a few years behind to catch up on stuff, but companies don't activate in the motorcycle industry. Yeah. And then, so if you go to them and you're like lucky enough to get them to sponsor you as a team or whatever the case is, they don't do anything with it. So yeah. even if they throw 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand at you, they don't do anything. They don't see any return. And yeah. I think that's like in my opinion, one of the biggest problems with the motorcycle industry. And I mean, you probably see that more so because most of the companies you work with are outside the industry and they actually get it. Yeah. So they activate and, and then it makes it like a valuable relationship, but it's hard to break into those companies until you get to a certain level. And I think that's probably what deters people a little bit like Maddie or whoever, but then also people are like, they just, they don't have that mindset, like a marketing kind of mindset. Yeah. Which is disappointing because I think you have to know yeah. for longevity. Dude, I, I make way more money, not way more, but I make more money on my, like personal helmet deals. My helmet alone makes more money now than I ever got paid as a salary from any factory team by a ton. Wow. So it's like yeah. like that's what I've been working for over the last 10 years and like I've finally gotten to that point. And it's no it's like we talked about it's not just putting the logo on the helmet, you know, social media, saying things on TV, going and doing events for them, things like that. Obviously it's like a it's a big thing you got to do. It's not just slapping a sticker on like a lot of people think that they can just do and get money. And some people do do that. Like, you know, but those are like the ones that just want to help. Right. Like, okay, yeah, I'll give you five grand, put this on your helmet. And that's cool. You love those people because they just do it because they just love you mm-hmm. and they, they just want to help out. Um, but when it comes to like those bigger deals, it's got to be like, you got to put a lot of effort into it. And sometimes like you, you don't realize how much goes into it. Like, even for me this year with, with OnlyFans, like we have to do 25 videos and it's just, it's a lot to like try to manage and come up with ideas. And, you know, the off season we'll do most of them right now. We're just doing the race videos, but even the race videos are hard because you just, a lot of your energy goes into like doing that. And luckily now I have a good program with Lanky, my video guy to where he just films and we don't need to think about it much. You know, it's more Mm -hmm. just like behind the scenes stuff, but I still like try to come up with fun things to do. Um, and it's, Sometimes it's draining. Yeah. How does how has the OnlyFans thing gone? Is it it's a lot of people that like you, is yours paid for people to subscribe to you or no. you just have it free? Yeah, they wanted it to be free to to subscribe just so that that way people just came to the platform and they didn't have like reasons why they couldn't or whatever. They want it accessible. And then but the main thing we push is OF.tv, which is if you think of like a YouTube channel or Netflix, it's the same. Like you don't there's no ads. There's no, you don't need to sign up for anything, but every one of my races or every race weekend that we have from last year and this year, there's a video for it that's like 20 minutes long. Um, and you can go on there and watch it for free and you just search my name. But it's, there's no like, you know, a lot of people are like, I always hear like stuff about like, oh, I don't want to look at that or see stuff like nudity, whatever. It's like OFTV, you can't post any nudity. It's like, it's probably, it's, just it's just as strict as like YouTube. Like you can't do mm-hmm. anything, can't say some things, whatever. Um, so if you go on there, like you're not gonna see anything. Even if you go to onlyfans.com and you make you have to make an account, and even when you make an account, you don't just see it's not like a porn website. <laughs> it's like you don't just see that. You have to actually like have a link to that person because they protect that person's privacy. Like they only want girls being found if they share the link. You can't just like search their name and find them. Mm-hmm. Um I think for like the athletes, you can search their name and find them easier. But like I can go to OnlyFans right now and go to the website and not see anything unless I choose to go find it and like find someone who posts it. So um, 
it's it's just taken a little while to like get that across to people because mm. a lot of people don't know that. But it's it's been amazing. I mean, being able to have a video guy like now I'm to the point where like I messed up and I was trying to like pay for a videographer as a salary for the year and it just it just was a headache and didn't work right. So I'm paying per video still, but it's given me the opportunity to like just make a lot of content and do a lot of fun things and and um yeah it's it's been one of the best sponsors i've ever had and and the people that are there they're like super into racing like they mm. you know now that they're with american racing they go to the gp races they go to he's one of the guys there is big in a formula one so they're he lives in monaco and he goes to formula one all the time and um yeah it's nuts and a lot of people don't realize that they're this last year they were the second highest this is what i'm told is they were the second highest e-commerce website in the world behind amazon yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, and they're oh, yeah. and what's crazy is like I mean, like you say, they're making this big pivot, like and it's yeah. just happening all over. Hundreds it's, of athletes. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's pretty cool as well to see a company start to see, hey, right, we need to make a pivot. We need to open up market share and make it a little bit different, and just have it uh, different. Because I mean, there's been platforms before that have tried this and haven't been successful, and it seems like OF is actually. I always think it's like a timing thing. They're at the right time right now where they're able to have the money to make the pivot. Yeah. And it, I think people are starting to recon- recognize, especially with this whole getting off TV, like actual TV, cable and all that, and becoming more YouTube and all that. So I think it's like the perfect time. It's really cool. Yeah. How do how – because you were with a management company for a while, and then I, th- I think I remember you left them, what, like five years ago now maybe? Yeah. Something like that? How do you, how does that, how do deals like that come about for people who don't really understand how sponsorship actually works get, or getting sponsors? Obviously you have a big name, which helps a lot, but how does something like OnlyFans come together? Um, yeah, so I was, I was with Wasserman for, I don't know, it was from like 2000, 2011 or something like that until 2016, 17. Just so people, and, people that don't know, what is Wasserman? Uh, they're just like one of the bigger you know, motorsports like agencies, like managers, um, they're they're all over there, in every sport. Like the Olympics, they're I think they're even in like Hollywood, like acting and stuff mm. like that. So they're huge. They're huge. Um, I've been with them twice now, and both times I ended up leaving because I just felt like the power that they had to make deals happen, it wasn't happening, and. I was always bringing the opportunities to them and then they were just making the deal happen. So why don't I just hire a lawyer? And so that that's what I did. And it's just, I, I, I'm so against managers now that I like, I wish that everyone would just get away from them because I also feel like managers, especially in our sport are so connected to every rider in the paddock or every team because they talk to them all the time that, and they, if, as long as they have enough riders, they're just going to keep, you know, it's going to be the same guys going to these teams because they just end up plucking from their mm-hmm. pool, right? Um, but I had I had left um, right before Daytona last year, and then I think Andy Debrino posted a photo of my helmet before I announced the OnlyFans deal. And the, the guy that worked at, at the company that at Wasserman um, just told me, like, you're in breach of all your contracts. You're not going to make any money. This is the dumbest decision you make in your whole career. Um, nobody's going to go for this. <clears throat> and it's been the best sponsor I've ever had. And people have reacted super well to it. Um, but it was literally just a DM on Instagram. Like I just reached really? out and time went by, forgot about it. And then the guy from there reached out on like his separate account. Uh, I was like, this seems weird. Like, why? I've never had that happen. But it ended up, yeah, it ended up working out and and just being sick. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else this. Yeah, no, it's, it's hard to explain it. Probably. <laughs> How the, do you? The, sorry, it's probably the biggest company right now. I mean, every every girl from your your high school, or, you didn't go, you didn't finish high school, but every girl from your high school, at least at least a couple of them got an OnlyFans link in their bio. So yeah, I don't, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I never went on there before. Yeah. Like honestly, I didn't. Um, but, but I yeah, you hear about it all the time. And yeah. now that I'm, you know, with that coming, I I ask, I see more things pop up. I see people write me DMs like, "Hey, I already post on here. Like, how'd you get your deal with this company?" And it's like, 
I don't know. I, I yeah. just ignore it because I'm like, I, I, I want to help people. But I also don't want to just like give it away. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, hey, here's how I made, you know. Yeah. <laughs> have you seen, have you seen the, uh, the super cross guy? There's a yeah. couple of them who are actually not sponsored by only fans, but sponsored by the girls free, from only yeah. fans. I feel so, like, is it Carno? Yeah. Logan Carno. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're making so much money on there. Like they got, I guess, right off. So, <laughs> yeah. like, so I was, <laughs> Carnell was like getting sponsored by girls on OnlyFans and he would post their link on the bike. Right. I was the first athlete sponsored by them, like f- actually from the company. And then he ended up being sponsored by them as well. Oh, uh, okay. And I, yeah, we've, we've talked, like I, tr- I try to talk to almost all the like athletes. They have like mountain bikers, fighters. They got a UFC fighter now. Like they have Indy lights drivers they are I heard some rumors about like actual Indy car stuff. They're on the American racing moto two team, which at first, I was bummed out about it because I'm just like, I mean, you know how it is. Like, <laughs> no, not at not at OnlyFans, but just bummed at American Racing. I'm like, yeah. For, they first they went after Fresh and Lean, they got Fresh yeah. and Lean, then yeah. they got OnlyFans. I'm just like, come on, like, yeah. Can you go after like, yeah. hey, give me your Snap on contact, give me your Hertz contact, right. like, come on. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, from the outside, you would think that you guys just have the same manager. No, yeah, yeah, that's kind of how it is. But obviously, you don't. So, I got a question for people. Obviously, you don't need to tell us any numbers, but how do you come up with a number going after? Right. So, like, if you're in the industry, numbers are obviously different, but they're a little, they're probably a lot smaller. Um, when you look at somebody outside the industry that big, how are you confident enough? like for people listening to value yourself at a, a number that's worth the value. I don't know how to say it. Maybe Corey, you can rephrase yeah, it. I don't know what you mean. Yeah. How do you go to a company like OnlyFans and say I'm worth this much money? Yeah. 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 If it's, if it's, if it's like a regular company here and it's 30 grand, it's 300 at OnlyFans. Just those are not numbers, but I'm, no matter, no matter what number you end up getting from a company, you're always like, Oh, I could have got more. Like it, that's always going to happen. Like, but it's, it's the same as like, you know, it's do like you any, have, <laughs> but do you have like a, a formula you use? Do you like actually research it or you're like, you know what? 80 grand sounds good right now. Or a hundred, you know, like 30 grand sounds good. Or, you know, like, you, you got to like go off of like different industries, look at what they're doing, look at different, like whatever their social platforms are. Like I, I try to like, kind of like come up with good numbers. Okay. Um, and I also like, going back to like making the companies like kind of work with you to promote. It's not always just like the activation, but it's like, okay, like in order to do this right, I need a video guy. So part of your job is to like help me pay for a video guy, or it may be like, I want to get a new helmet at every race. Like with now with freshly and only fans, like I have a new painted helmet every weekend. And that's like part of my strategy to draw some awareness to the brands because if people are constantly talking about a new design or asking what your new design is, then they're looking at the companies on the helmet, obviously, or talking about it on TV or whatever it is. Um, so I try to like find ways to bring that, find the value. And like, you know, it's, you're never going to have the like perfect number because you always see like, I don't know who you, who are you talking about? Soccer player, football player, Mbappe? Yeah. I, I, like soccer, I don't follow he, it yeah, really so, well, but, Football or soccer, yeah. But they're just always, even in, like I follow baseball and basketball and there's just like one year the biggest deal ever is 250 million then the next year it's 400 million. Like it's always changing. Yeah. And if you look at racing, it's like uh, everything costs more. Travel costs more. Video guys cost more. And now that there's more video guys, they're driving the prices up more and more and more. You got to pay for these guys to be in hotels or travel, whatever. So everything gets more and more expensive, but there's no like, no, I don't have like some magic number. Like, you know, there's, I've, I've taken way too low of numbers and then, and then ended up, it grew a a ton, but also it depends on how much that company wants or how much you're going to promise them. Like you got to look at your time and, and all that stuff. And yeah. It, it, there's really never a magic number, but okay. it's just like talking to a girl, right? Like whenever you, you know, you're trying to find your girlfriend or whatever, it's like, oh, I can't talk to her. Like she's way too good looking for me, right? Like you just, you got to figure it out. Then emo- <laughs> it. And then emojis were creative. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what do you think, uh, what do you think about kind of the younger generation uh, of, of kids coming up or even like um, one of your buddies, Brandon Pash, you know, mm. as far as their approach and, and, how they're doing things in a, in, a, in a way to be able to keep racing, I guess. I just think that the younger... Man. You got beef with him? Who? Pash? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, I'm... I mean, you guys go at it on social. Is that just... It's it's just... 
It is what. Yeah, it is what. I don't know. I never understood. Especially it. like the Daytona <laughs> 200 stuff. It was always around Daytona. 200. I never understood it. It was just like fun. somebody being. I was like having fun with stuff and being goofy, and then it turned into like he wanted to just play off of it and it, or whatever. Yeah, you know, I don't really care. <laughs> it just it was annoying at the time, but it's like whatever. Like yeah. do your thing. Yeah. Gets people what talking. You do, I guess. Talk, then I guess that's what you gotta do. But, um, I mean, he's kind of followed a little bit. I would say in your footsteps on kind of the hooligan, but maybe now he's like gone more supermoto. But he's kind of has a little bit of that. He gets who, it. Yeah, yeah, he gets yeah. it. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, I I always respect people that like understand that. Like even me and Wyman had beef at one point, and I don't even know why, but we just did. I think it's got a lot to do with whenever people do think the same way and they think that they're the one that's kind of being different they want to stay that person or i I don't know but we end up beefing like i think me and lyman are fine now but for a long time like we just didn't talk or if we saw each other on track like there was always this like Hmm. i don't know um yeah i don't know i don't i don't want to get into the whole posh thing there's there's nothing there i mean i got them I just don't want to communicate with him. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't need to. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, I guess more so my question is like when you see what he's doing or what other kids, you know, coming up should be doing, what is your kind of opinion or perspective on on that coming from experience obviously? I think you know, times have changed, but like when I was younger like you got to like prove your who you, are. you know, you got to like almost like a freshman coming into like what or whatever a new guy rookie coming into a baseball team where like you got to earn your keep like type of thing like you can't just be like a you know i would just like to see some some of them like not be so like over the top about accomplishments that you're i get it like we're all here racing we want to have fun but don't like play it off like like some social media influencers is like oh i got 50,000 followers i'm the shit like, yeah, yeah. And I'm not, there's no one in particular I'm talking about. I just, if you have 50,000 followers and you think it's about you, it's not. I just pick the number. <laughs> but yeah, I just, you, that happens so much. And I'm sure that we're all guilty of it. Maybe people have probably thought that about me before too. I, I don't, I try not to be like that, but you're never at the top. There's always somebody that's better than you at something. And I think I've always tried to, you know, I, I'm sometimes bad at like understanding the achievements that we do, like that it is cool. But just remember that even if you're in America and you're not the top guy yet, like right now, Gagne is the top guy and none of us have beat him. Like he's still number one. And I think a lot of people just try to be the McGregor. I think too early. Right. People like it. They feed into it. I've done it before. I did it with Bobier. I remember telling him, like, I think one year I made a post, and I wrote him, and I said, hey, just so you know, I'm joking. Like, this isn't, like, a serious thing. I'm just trying to get, like, something going. But it just was stupid. Like, I, I said, like, oh, he's going to wish he stayed. He went to Europe or something because he didn't go to Moto2, and I said something like that. So I have been that guy before, but I also was already, like, there. I was competitive in Superbike. I was, like, it's not yeah. like I just was coming up and trying to be like that. So we, we do need that, like, kind of like those feuds like me and Eslick in a way but but that seemed like natural i think some yeah. of the things is like i guess my question are you ever you're i mean earlier you said that this is just who you are yeah you're just doing you you're yeah. not trying to be like a showman i yeah. guess even though you have it a little bit in the background you do things for that but it is kind of it's who you are and you're not trying to be maybe somebody you're not I, I like see I see the value sometimes in like hey let's do this a little bit like let's play up with it like but be a little controversial or the con- polarizing is probably a better word a little bit right yeah I don't I don't know about the controversial thing what do you mean by polarizing like like if you do something on a far end of the spectrum and it gets people's attention like yeah. it's you, you said the press is press yeah like I remember like Posh is he like said something about like let's create beef before Daytona last year. And I was like, we were riding Supermoto together. Like we were friendly, like the, it, like it's not like we're these enemies. Yeah. And I was just like, the way I said it to him was, no, you're not on my level. Like, why would I do that? But it wasn't like, you're not as good of a rider as me. Yeah. It was, I have a reach of 400,000 people. You have a reach of 10,000. What am I getting out of it? That was my point as like a business type of thing. Like, 
I'm going to give you attention, but you're not, you're going to bring attention from people who are already yeah. following me. That's where it all started. Mm. And it wasn't because I don't like him. Yeah. Nothing, nothing bad happened, but he took like, I don't even think that he thought that was mean. I think he just wanted to use that as like a play to say like, oh, he said this to me and he was saying I'm not good enough rider, but that wasn't at all what I said. And then he made some video saying that, oh, I beat Josh Heron at Supermoto <laughs> after that. I said it like it just was like yeah. this drama for no reason. That's what I don't like. Yeah. If we come to an agreement and it's like, hey, let's make some fun like doing this, then I'm cool with that because it's I know it's for the show and I'm not I'm not always fake but there's a time when yeah if you think that yeah like what you said if you think it could create some like spark that's what i want i don't want this like oh they hate each other thing i don't like that but it got to that point because he was like poking 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 so much but to me it's just so fake like we see each other in the paddock and then he wants to talk i'm like don't make it look like i'm like an asshole when i'm not because then i'm gonna be an asshole and then it's like yeah mm. why why like, I, I don't like that because, like I said, we need to respect each other. Yeah. That's, like, the biggest thing is, like, we're out there, like, risking our lives. We're, you know, going 180 miles an hour with each, right by side by side with each other. We got to trust each other. We got to, you know, we got to like each other at least enough to go have a drink after. Um, doesn't mean I'm going to invite you over to spend the night or something, but it's, like, we just, we got to respect each other. Um, so, so the thing that I just wish with the younger generation is that, like, just remember, you have, like, five more classes to go through before you're, like, there. So, yes, winning Junior Cup or Twins Cup is cool, and it's exciting, and I'm happy for you. But don't, like, try to make it seem like you're the best in your sport because, like, you don't see minor league baseball guys, like, acting right. like that because they know they got to get way further in their sport. And that's, like, that, for some reason, like I said, I'm happy for them. They're all, like, a lot of them raced at my house and it's sick seeing them being able to be on that platform but i don't know they're super talented as well oh yeah and some days sometimes i feel like you got to focus a little bit on the talent and you know hone your craft a little bit i mean i would i kind of agree with you there yeah a I, little think the, bit. I think the mcgregor reference is probably the biggest yeah. thing like everyone sees that and it works but conor mcgregor is number one in the world and it's fighting it's, but it's i also fight. different it's also weird because there's really like you either go to ufc or you don't like there's lower fights, but there's no real like, you know. Gregor yeah. was a he was a bum, and then he went UFC, and it just worked. That's why I think it's like different. This isn't. I love Moto America. I love everything they do, but the one thing that I do wish that they would do different is not make it pro racing for Junior Cup or Twins Cup. Make it like some type of level below, like minor league baseball. Like, why are we all professional racers? They've making it. They in my eyes, they've make made it seem like. There's no difference between Junior Cup and Superbike. It's too attainable to be. Yeah. Yeah. A no, pro racer sure. and all this stuff. Like it's not prestige enough. And and it's not because like even if I wasn't racing, and it was just me looking at you guys, like okay, Corey's spent his whole life getting to this spot right now, and he's made it to this awesome team, and he's almost on a Superbike podium, but then you're giving the same amount of attention to this guy because it's not fair if you don't. Right. type of thing like in 18 when i was much bigger on social media than anybody in the paddock and it was drawing people to the series and to the races and people were literally messaging like i never heard about racing but we're coming to the races because of you use that but somebody had said like the marketing company that they hired at the time like told them like we need to post about him more and someone said that's not fair we we have to post this person just as much as we post him that's not how it should work. No. This and that's what the world is doing now. It's like it's not fair. Here's a, a participation award. Yeah. And that's what Bobby sometimes gets frustrated about is like how much money the superbike teams pay to be there and be a premier entry, all this stuff. But then social media, which is T V now, it I mean, really it it's right. bigger than T V, I would say, is they're making us all on this level playing field and it's like it's not that yeah, don't do that. Like yeah make it to where people want to earn that spot instead of just like, here it is. And then like, Oh, I could just stay in twins cup forever. And I'm not talking about a specific rider. I, it could be stock thousand, it could be junior cup, whatever, yeah. but make it to where they want to get to this spot so that they can get that attention. Because otherwise, why is Jake Gagne going out and doing what he's doing? Why is a sponsor going to pay them when they could just pay these guys to have the same amount of attention on that mm. 
thing, you know, that series. Yeah. No, it makes, um, makes I do love sense. everything Moto America's doing, and I, I'm yeah, pumped from, to be here. I'm not saying anything yeah, yeah, like... Um, it's probably this is the, something I would tell to them. Yeah, yeah. It's probably the biggest it's been in a long time Yeah, as far as, like, social media. They're doing really, really well in, in a lot of areas. Baggers. Dude, baggers <laughs> is it, man. When are you getting on a bagger? I did it already. When are you going to race? <laughs> I heard. I, we, there was a rumor that you were you got a, approached by Indian. Yeah. Um, last, last year, my goal was to do... Um, it was supposed to be on O'Hara's teammate and do super sport uh, on the V2 again and do the Indian program. But then whenever we did super bike or like when they announced, they decided I was going to do super bike, it was way too much and it just, it didn't work out. But I, I was all for it because I just, do I you, think it's good. You rode it? Oh no, I didn't ride it. Oh, you haven't rode the bike. They wanted me to ride it and Dude. we told them that we weren't going to ride it. Like we're not doing, cause I did that with Yosh and I'm not down for that. Like testing the bike to get a tryout and see. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. The, people will say, oh, it's because we want you to, and I'm not saying they said this, but yeah. they like make it seem like when I say they, I just mean in general, like, oh, we want to make sure you like the bike. And like, no, it's like, yeah, they want to make try. sure you're going to do good on it. Like, I don't, I've, I've been here for 18 years. I don't need to try out to make yeah. sure I'm good enough to do something like I can do it. So you're a fan of baggers. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's sick. I mean, yeah. it's kind of cool. I just wish that the bikes were more even. I wish it's that, common. I think it's common. I mean, that's what I wish. I mean, the development, we don't have sidetrack so much, but it's like the development's so high. I mean, because trust me, I mean, being on Vance and Hines, like chomping at two factories sucks, but it's finally getting leveled off a little bit and we need it to happen more. I mean, we need, yeah. we need four more guys. We need Saddleman there and then we need two more Indians. Like we need two more good Indians that can be there every weekend. So we've got eight, eight to 10. Yeah. I mean, so I, I'm a fan of it though, and I and, and I would race it. I mean, I think now I'm in a different, yeah, path. Like now that I've gone back to superbike, and I'm like, okay, I'm, I am competitive. I can do it. My mindset's a little bit different. I, yeah. I don't want to take away from that, yeah. but I'm never gonna be just be like, no, I'm not racing that. I mean, like, let's talk. Like, yeah. let's figure out what, what we have. What uh, kind of talking on that? I mean, through- actually, going back to it really quick, I had an opportunity to race with the factory Harley, like. So they, I was in Hawaii, and they actually reached out to me the first year Screaming Eagle took over the program, and Jason... Keel. Keel? Uh, Kel. Kel? Yeah. Reached out to me when I was out there and was like, hey, are you interested in doing this? And I was like, whoa. Like, out of nowhere. I, I didn't even think I'd ever... Like, I did that bagger at Laguna, and it was fun, but whenever he reached out, I was like, dude, like, crap. Like, I... I Honest to God, like I had just gotten this deal with Yamaha on the fresh and lean ride. And I was like thinking like, how can I make this? I just thought it, I was like, there's potential here that this could be bigger than what Superbike is. And I could ride this for a long time. This is something that like, if I don't do good, it's like a one year and done type thing, which it did turn into. Part of me like wishes I would have done that. A little bit. Yeah. I think timing's everything though. I mean, you can see, could you imagine doing three races, Laguna and then two two bag races everybody says the baggers are easy but they're not i mean oh you, no not with superbike i'm talking yeah. about instead of doing superbike oh that year. wow yeah yeah oh i thought you would try to do both oh no i, I had like thought about at the time like Don't. trying to back out of my deal and going over oh, there wow because it just i mean it is i mean you can see it there's huge. there's it is big it's kind of, I, just, I don't think anybody really yeah. expected it and with i knew like with the head start that I had on everybody was because it's not that I'm better at social media. I just had a head start and I do, you know, I consider myself like in a small box or window of people that know how to do it. Better. Understand her. But everybody has their shot because it's all about being relatable. It's just being you. And if people like how you are, then, you know, you get a bunch of people following you. It's, and it sucks. It sucks. It's like that, but it's just like anything else in the world. And with the head start that I had, at that time, I was like, I could blow this up. Like, I could take... Because, yeah, like, when huge. I did the bagger videos in 19, when I was on Shivey and I did Laguna, like, I got over a million views on YouTube on just getting ready for the bagger race. Yeah. So I knew I could, like, I could get... I was thinking of all the specific sponsors I would reach out to just because. And, like, you know, when I picture, like, Harley and Indian, I think of a certain image. And right now, there's... It's... It's not like there. Yep. The image isn't there, and it doesn't match to me when I look at it from the outside. And it doesn't match like what it should match. Like, like I see like Aaron Guardo and and you know those dudes. I'm like, that's Harley. Yep. Like that's what I think of, and I think that 
Wyman's stuff does really great on social. Like he the, just the bike clips because people just love it. Like what the heck was the dude's hauling ass on this big bagger? But if he could like try to target that audience a little bit better, more of them would kind of gravitate towards. I think it. it needs to be a split. I I think so as well. I mean, not specifically targeting Wyman, but the like you say that they're so ingrained into and what you say about Aaron, they they are that is that's the image. Yeah. Like dude. You know, he's always wearing his get up and he, he looks like he's been working on it for a day before. Like, that's it. Yeah. Um, to to bridge that gap, though, to. That's what Harley's trying to navigate. That's what yeah. the industry's trying to navigate, yeah. I think, is they got to keep it alive. And also, I wasn't saying anything bad about no, women, by the way. No, 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 no. I almost you you didn't ask I for advice, anyway. but if, if I was in Wyman's shoes, I would try to kind of, yeah, bridge that relationship with like the, like, tall boy t like the stunt rider scene and like racing yeah. scene like try to like bring that together a little bit and not make it so like like factory road race look yep like type of thing hmm. it's interesting the, um well real quick i want to continue just sidebar this the chaining tatum thing at lagoon uh coda mm-hmm. dude how did that like how did that come about and was that just was it planned no um I had so in seventeen, <laughs> she was wild. In seventeen, whenever I had broke up with my ex, I I went and tried to live with my buddy Rico from Wiener Schnitzel, and he had like a condo in Irvine. And I was like, okay, I didn't have any money. I'm like, I can't afford to like be renting a room from you right now. So I moved back to Georgia because I had my place paid for out there. Started working construction with my dad, and being an idiot, I was just getting drunk every night and just doing things I should have been doing. And then it turned into like, oh, we have this opportunity with Richard. Like, cause I had been asking him to do it. And he talked about if Amin shut his doors down, that Richard wanted to do that program and it ended up happening. So I got like a little bit more serious and my buddy, uh, Steve DeCastro, Aaron Babayan and, uh, Tony Fapelli, they were all in Santa Monica at the time, Santa Monica and Venice. And Aaron was my, they're all my buddies, but Aaron was like a, he was a trainer for like Hollywood, like for actors and stuff. And Duffy, like, I mean, these guys are like, you know, trainers for Channing and they go like, like Brad Pitt. Like, I mean, they're very well connected with all these people. Right. So I reached out to him because I was like, Hey, I I would love to come out and train with Aaron. And I don't know for how long, but just, it'd be cool to come out there and hang out. So I started living on Aaron's couch in Santa Monica and we were just training every day. That's all we did. Like we would wake up, we would, we'd do our like little stretches. I'd go run do the stairs in Santa Monica. We'd go to Channing's house. I did a hyperbaric chamber. I did a training session with him and then I'd run like four miles back to the apartment and I'd go in the ocean. And it was just like a day. It was like a training camp basically for boxers, like for like three, four months or maybe more than that. And, um, just over that time, like, just being with them. And then Steve, like, actually that's what it was. Every morning I would wake up, I'd go for this walk with Steve because he was always like so big on Steve is like now they're all like father figures to me now. Cause they're all in their forties now and fifties. Um, and so we'd wake up, walk to the coffee, coffee spot. I don't drink, didn't drink coffee at times. So I would just get a water or whatever, walk back with him. Then I'd start my day with Aaron. And then Tony was like, the one that was always like, he needs to have fun. So that's like, I started drinking with Tony. So that's why like the Coors Light stuff kind of popped up. Like after track days, we'd have Coors Light. Like that was just our thing. And everybody at the track day. So Tony was like my fun guy. Like we'd go and drink and play pool and hang out at the beach. Aaron was like my trainer, but we also had fun. And I lived with him as like my roommate. And then Steve was like the father figure that was always like, no, don't do that. No, don't go to Red Bull for free. No, don't do this. And I, I love him to death, but that's Steve always he's always the father figure and so over time like we did track days and Channing did track days Dak Shepard was with them did track days Keanu Reeves with them did track all these guys like it's it was just nuts so um yeah Channing we just became good friends and and uh they came out to Coda and all of them were they had like passes from GP so they could get on like the access road and I I happened to win that race and I saw them like sitting on the track and I just like, like just break, like just backed it in, stopped and was just like celebrating with them. And then 
and then Chan was there, and it was just like he hopped on the bike, and <laughs> <laughs> we just went into the podium area, which yeah. was this was like the third, second to last corner I picked him up, yeah, so I yeah. literally just rode right in there. Um, but yeah, that was such a Huge. cool moment. Yeah, <laughs> like GP took it, everybody took it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was sick. It was sick. Have you ever talked about uh, trying to get on Dax's podcast? Or like, I think Bill Burr is also a super big MotoGP guy. Um, not really. I I asked Dax one time about being on his TV show that he had. That was like this. Uh, <laughs> I I try not to like be too about like. I mean, they're all my buddies, but it's hard not to be like that's cool. Like yeah. I ride with Channing or I ride with Dax. Yeah. Like, and they'd be bummed, I think, if you didn't care because it is cool. Yeah. I mean, it's just like I would hope that they're like pumped they get to come to the race and I won um but I asked him once about being on this tv show he did it was like a game show and he's like you're not cool enough to be on my game show <laughs> but he wasn't kidding he was being serious he was like because the show was about like people who have like saved people or done something yeah. like this guy pulled a guy out of a car fire or stuff like that yeah. um but and Josh Aaron does stunts <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why but I not that it's Dax's podcast, but like Gypsy Tales. I've been supposed to be on Gypsy Tales for like four months and I keep, something keeps happening and I don't go down there. Like we'll plan it and then I got sick or I got hurt and I was mm. like, always something, but I'm, I've been looking forward to doing that one. Um, but Dax's, I haven't, no, I don't think I'll ever get to do he's Dax's. Big, Even though he's yeah. all into racing, like yeah. the Formula One stuff and Ricardo and stuff, he, he went from like being a huge fan of road racing, a huge fan of F1 and now he's like all about F1 yeah. and, yeah. and, um, yeah, so so no, but but it is cool like seeing like channel do movies. I think Dax is too, where they just like wear their friends' shirts, like Metric Moto is a shop in LA that we mm -hmm. that we all went to. And our friend uh Sass runs it and like he'll be just wearing a Metric Moto shirt in his movie and it's like they're just cool dudes. That's like, sick. He he like really in eighteen he like really took me under his wing and like like I said, let me use the hyperbaric. The the house we would go to was their like the studio's office. So, so like instead of having like a real studio, they just had a house in Santa Monica that they all worked out of. So we would go there and use the hyperbaric, use the gym. And then like he would like, you know, find these like special like drinks or something that I, for me to try and buy them. And then he would like one time he like paid for this like rolfing massage. Have you ever heard of a rolfing I have, massage? I have. It's pretty brutal, isn't it? Yeah. Like they, like, yeah. So I did you that. Like, no, but like the lady like made me cry. <laughs> like I don't, not because it hurt. No, like she just did something. What does Rolf stand crying. for? Rolling on the. I don't know it, but it it was like super painful, and like super intimate, almost like a therapy session. And they like, mm. I don't know. I just like she got me to start crying and talking about stuff that was. But it, all of a sudden, it was just like relaxed, like, and she like got me into this state of mind where like I wasn't thinking about much, and then. I just started crying. I'm like, what is going on? Like a pressure point thing. I don't yeah. know. It was weird. Do you feel but, better after? Oh, yeah. That's yeah, cool. Like weight lifted off your shoulders. But but he, a lot of times, like gave me opportunities to do stuff and like meet people. And I got to go to like premieres of movies and stuff That's like that. Awesome. And yeah, they, that, that whole group is like, there's such a good group of people to be around. If you, you know, it's not like they just let anybody in. They're very yeah. protective of like who hangs out with them and, um, yeah, but it's neat. The day that I, I have, I've talked about it before, but I have like some tax problems that I'm still dealing with from when I was younger because I didn't file and pay taxes when I was younger because I just didn't know. Nobody taught you, nobody, and I wasn't with my family and nobody was making sure I was oh, doing wow. it. And um, I went to a track day and it was like Chan, Dax, Keanu Reeves, Brad Pitt showed up, like a few other people. Like it was like such a cool experience and like, my mom called me that day, like, hey, you got something in the mail saying you owe this much money to the IRS. Like, and it was, like, the worst day of my life. <laughs> like, literally should have been the coolest experience ever, and it was just, like, I did not yeah, even want to be there at all. But there was always so many cool things that we got to do because of Steve and Aaron and Tony, and, and we're still all now Steve, and <laughs> it was, like, very late in their lives, but they all had a kid. Steve and Tony had kids at the same time we had a kid, so oh, now, wow. now we have kids, even though they're, like, 10, 10, all of them are 10 to 15, 20 years older than me, but it's just worked that's out really awesome. cool. Yeah. That's only, that's the only thing I wish Motor America could figure out how to do a little better. It's like get those kind of people out there. I know it's tough because it's not as big and not as, as yeah, glamorous, but, but like, like Bill Burr, he's one of the mm -hmm. biggest, you know, comedian guys with obviously a big podcast and he's a huge, he's just organically a big fan. Yeah. Track days and whatnot. Um, 
just getting guys like that out to the track is it sounds stupid but it makes such a big difference in in their reach and just even like kind of affirming that we're not just a bunch of idiots riding around in circles you know the the problem is that i know what the problem is the problem is that they're growing so they have to take advantage of this them being there like they just yeah it's like a guy who's so excited to like hang out with a girl for the first time that they just can't help but be like hey when do you want to hang out when do you want to hang out like that type of thing that they want to interview him or they want to take photos of him and you cannot do that and i think that even when chan rode on the back of the bike it should have just been left alone because that was sick but then they interviewed him and it just every time i've had an opportunity to like have somebody come out to the track it's like okay well what are they going to do for us are they going to post for us are they going to do a photo with us like it's just a ticket yeah i just want to be there and they shouldn't have to go to will call to get the ticket just yeah. give me 10 tickets. Let me give them to all of them. Like I'm super well connected in like, not, not me personally, but friends of friends like music industry and like Lil Wayne and T-Pain and like all these guys that my friends who are really in the track days would probably try to bring them out. But it's like such a thing instead of just like, whoa, what the heck? Like, it's, let's just say Channing comes to the race and he posts about it or Dax comes and just talks about it on his podcast six months later. Like, it's enough. Just leave it alone. Yeah. And, and some people there understand, but then some people don't. And you have to just like let those things happen. Like, you, you get it's got to be like an easier thing yeah, it's because be organic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you've known you've known some of those guys by just you know the dealership and like mm-hmm. stuff like in New York, like you know Lewis and them, they know a lot of these people, and it's it's got to be easier because. Yeah, they don't want to come and, like, have people go around them. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, Fuck, we're at two and a half hours. I know. I I kind (laughs) of... I do have a couple other ones. I kind of want to lead into a couple bike stuff. Like, dude, you've ridden a factory Yamaha, a factory Suzuki Yosh bike. I mean, I don't know how far your Ducati is, but it's... I mean, you got some Ducati Corsa parts on there, if not all. I've been told it's the exact... like. Not just from Bobby, but like Paolo, like okay. it's the exact same bike, and we're like, You're I'm on. not gonna say the number that he yeah, told me, no. but it's very low of real bikes, and it is. I okay. mean, it comes directly from them, same exact bike, except for whatever rules were a little tiny bit different. But mm-hmm. so that's three actual factory bikes. I don't know what other bikes besides you rode a Moto Two bike. Was- uh, the it was Suter chassis. Mm-hmm. Now that one's a little bit further off, but like you've ridden three factories. Like not a lot of people can say they can rode one. Like it's kind of crazy that you've rode for three different factories and been successful with all three r- relatively and, um, been pretty high up. Uh, now like what's your favorite, obviously Ducati's the furthest along in development because we're in the future. Right. But what is your favorite motorcycle? And like, what are the differences that of the evolution of bikes coming from your factory Yamaha Superbike to the Yosh bike to now the Ducati, which seems to be on another level with electronics and, and things with wings and crazy enough. And what's that evolution been like? So I would say, you know, every time you're on that team, it's your favorite. Like as long as you're doing good, like that's your same as the tracks. Like what's your favorite track? Like, <laughs> well, if you ask me tomorrow, it'll be different. Right. Like maybe tomorrow I ride really good at Brainerd or, yeah. And then all of a sudden this is my favorite track. Like you it always changes. Um it's it's been wild, that's for sure. Um I couldn't pick a favorite. Like if I if you I just honestly can't. Like I I don't think it's fair to say a favorite of yeah. the three. I think okay. a younger me would have just been like, Oh, the Ducati is. The Ducati is sick and I love riding the bike and it's been a dream of mine to like ride one. I never thought that I would ride one. And it Dude, it's amazing. I, there's not one thing I could say negative about it, but I'm also not going to say that one of them is my favorite over the others. Okay. I think the situation that I'm in right now with this team and Ducati, this is my favorite team I've ever rode for. Um, I feel like myself, I have that factory bike with the small family feel team, and it just, everything clicks right now. And I'll do whatever it takes to stay on this team. Um, I don't care if, I'm racing baggers with them. I don't care if I'm racing twins cup with them. I don't, I don't care. Like I just want to be on this team. Um, and, uh, yeah, but it's been sick. The coolest thing I think that I could say like accomplishment in racing for me is racing for all three of those brands and winning a race on all three of those brands. That is cool. Because 
I don't know how many have done it, but I know it's there's got to be less than five people that have ever won on three different brand bikes. Um, so that to me has been the coolest thing. And then I've podiumed in Superbike on four different manufacturers. So it's to me, it's just that's the best part about like my whole career. If I just talk about racing and don't bring in like teams, friends, family, like that's the coolest part. And to kind of move with that, first, what's it like not having a teammate? Mm-hmm. And then who was your strongest <laughs> teammate? And I guess I can go one further. What was it like having Zarco as a teammate? Um, I would say, man, so not having a teammate, I, I mean, I do have one, but he's not on the super bike. Well, that's what I mean. Like you don't um, have somebody that you're head to head and that's got to be yeah. one. I mean, you've done it a couple times now, but that's, it's become more and more, but it's not likely. Usually you've got somebody who's really fast, who's next to you yeah. in a super bike team, especially what's it like not having that? And is it harder to, that everything's relied on you? And if you crash like day done for super bike, I think, you know, I, I heard Stan Bowley say something about like on their podcast about, Oh, he's, he's doing good. Cause he doesn't have a teammate. Cause he's had like 20 reasons why I won't do good. And then why I am doing good. And now his most recent one is that I'm don't have a teammate. So <laughs> that's why I'm doing good. And so I do think there's some truth to that because for me, like I can just be me. It doesn't matter if I'm fourth, you know, if it does affect me sometimes, like if there's a teammate that's doing better than I am or whatever, but it's also about having like good people on the team. So I don't have any decision when it comes to who the teammate would be if we were to have another bike next year. But I do have like some like um, influence, like I can give my input to it where if you're at Yamaha or whatever, like you're not, they don't care what you say. This team actually will care. Like, what's going to make us succeed together the most, right? So I could put my input in. Like, I wish that I could have had. I loved Petrucci last year, and I loved Chavi, but Baz, I was like so excited about having as a teammate. That was like he was supposed to ride for the team the year that I was going into this team, and I was so excited because I think that we're similar. Like, just a lot of the things that we've done in the past, a lot of things, reactions that we have, our riding style, like a lot of it is similar. And like just racing against him, like we we're always. It was fun. Like, I enjoyed it. Where a lot of people complained about his style, but I liked it. Um, so I I do like having a teammate. If it's a good teammate that you can have fun with and, like, be competitive with and be, like, fired up if they do better. Like, Tommy Aquino. Like, we used to, like, just... It was, like, we always wanted to, like, just battle each other. Joe Roberts. Like, we were friends and wanted to battle each other. But when you start getting, like, too competitive and it's somebody that you just have something that you maybe you don't get along super well or you think they don't like you, then it's harder because it's easy to have those mind games. And I, I don't know. Yeah, that, that makes it hard. Um, so uh, favorite teammate? Or like what was it like having Hayes as a teammate? Or, or And then I, I, would always, I always wanted to wonder because Zarko is such a unique character, mm-hmm. but he's very headstrong. Yeah. And it was probably not your best time. What was that like? Um, Zarco as a teammate was, he was super nice, always super nice, super respectful of like anybody that was around. Um, but his manager at the time was, his name was like Lohan or something like that. And I think that guy like made Zarco kind of like a head case. Like he would like make him go run in his leathers if he did bad or like, oh wow. He wasn't allowed to have a cell phone, he wasn't allowed to have a social media account. He wasn't allowed to do anything. Hmm. Um, Interesting. There's stuff I heard on that in that relationship, like I can't even talk about because yeah. it's just yeah, it's just Fine. messed up to talk about it. Yeah. But just weird stuff. Yeah, not not like in a weird way. But yeah, just, no. I mean, he's he's. I think he's part of ways with him. Yeah, he has, and so. the guy. I think that's good. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't in a good headspace to like really. He didn't really care to like make a friend. Okay. And. I was the type of person that was always like, I'm always just trying. Like if I'm, if I have to be around you, yeah. like I, I like, I naturally just like everybody that I meet and I want to like be buddies with them. But if they're, if they're like not receptive to that and they don't try back, then I just don't try. Like yeah. If I feel like I have to try to have a conversation, I just, and it's not because it's not like, oh, I hate you now. It's yeah. just like, okay, we're not, we're not vibing. Like I'm not going to play high school and like try to, try to do that. Yeah. So that's why I think a lot of people in the paddock, 
maybe have something to say about me because I just am not like, hey, how you been? Like, I just, I don't like being fake. I just stay to myself. And, and if there's people who try to talk to me, then it's like, we get along really well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like his manager one time, I don't know if he was trying, but I'm pretty sure he was. We were at, um, Alec, what's the track that everybody tests at? Alicante. That's, I think that's a new, a new track there, but Cartagena. No. Oh man. Tito Rabat owns it. Or oh yeah, yeah. Elmeria. Elmeria. Yeah. Um, whenever his, ma- yeah. So his manager, Lohan, like we we're at, uh, what did we just, Elmeria. Yeah. You're down the straightaway. Come over. He couldn't speak yeah. English. So he's like translating, like trying to translate to me, like what to tell me. And he's like, Oh, Zarco breaks at the, you're breaking at the 400 meter, whatever it is. Right. He's breaking at the, you're breaking at four. He's breaking at the three. And I'm just like, I'm off of his pace, but I'm not like, you know, within a second or something. I'm just like, what? No That's way. Deep. So I'm like, all right, like whatever. So I go out and I try it. And like the dude is just trying to kill me. Like not literally, but like I just went off, almost hit the wall. Like I, I was so pissed. And that was like right when I had found out that, a, that Aquino had passed away. So it was literally like that test. And I didn't go to the first day. Um, I think I was sick and like just that, I was like, dude, this is fucked. Like, and then the next day I rode, he did that to me and I'm just like, dude, fuck you. Like I'm out. I, I think I just left. I didn't want to ride anymore. Um, so that guy was like a little toxic, yeah. but Zarko was cool. And I'm, I've, he, like I said, he never like tried. I don't think to like, he never, it never really was a thing, Okay, but, um, just seeing him like do good was cool like yeah that was cool like i always now he's like one of the guys i root for just because we're teammates and he never did anything wrong to me and you know i i I saw i think that was almost like a bad parent relationship like i think that held him back even though he did good um did super good but (laughs) but i also look at that as like okay when i was testing because in moto 2 like i was testing and was doing good and like went to valencia and i was like within i was within a second of everybody like i didn't it wasn't like I was way off. Yeah. And it um it kind of motivates me sometimes because that was his like fourth year in Moto Two whenever I was there and he was just getting his first podium and now he's winning or he hasn't won a GP race, but he's been on a podium tons of times. So it's like motivating, like, all right, like I wasn't like that bad when I was there. So it it's it's Thanks. cool being able to look at other people and see how long it took them to succeed and hmm. everybody's different, right? But it also like it took them a while. Bobier did the best for sure out of all three of us, but even him, like most of the races in the first year was 15th to 20th, somewhere around there. I think you got thrown to the wolves a little bit too. I mean, you won the Superbike championship and I think the expectation was just so high for not the bike not being that good. Um, I'm not going to say the team was bad or anything, but the suitor wasn't the best bike. No. I mean, Tom Lutu was the only one really doing anything on it and Zarko would have shines of brilliance, but just speaking on that, like with Spees and some of the guys, I feel like the expectation was if you, if I feel like if you didn't podium, you was a failure. Yeah. Like I, at least top tens. I like, just, and I, I mean, I, I did one wild card and being 1.1 off is nothing yeah. and you're last. Yeah. And then you're finishing 45 seconds behind the leader and it sucks. Yeah. What was your biggest takeaway from struggling through that year coming back um, to the US? Like, obviously, what, like, what would be a positive of oh, that? Oh, just getting up to speed quickly. Like, that's something I've always wanted to be better at, but I couldn't. And now, like, I think it, a lot of it has to do if you're comfortable on the bike. But if I'm comfortable on the bike, like, this year it's been, like, a mission of mine to be, like, okay, I may not be the P1 at the end of the session, but I want to be the fastest lap, the first flying lap. And I've been able to do it, like, pretty much every time that we've gone somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, not Maybe not the first session because I'm learning this bike, but, like, as the weekend goes, like, I want to be, like, my first flyer. I want it to be the fastest one and i'm usually like way faster than Mm -hmm. everybody on the first flyer which could be a stupid thing because you're like not taking a look at the track but also like it's a road race course it's not a dirt bike track like it doesn't really change um and as long as there's no oil dryer something down like i just make it a goal of mine to do that because it just gives me like a little bit of confidence like all right like like i feel good and so yeah i think that was one of the biggest things and the other thing would just be like maybe getting a little bit at the time like maybe the next year, the next couple of years, like it didn't, but being a little bit more mentally tough, like it definitely helped with that because now like it's, 
it's easy to forget what you tell yourself. Like, okay, calm down. Like if you're in sixth, fifth, calm down. Like it's fine. You still like, I'm like, like fuck, I should be in second or third, whatever, first, whatever, whatever it is. Um, but it, I just, if I take a breath, I'm like, all right, it's not motive two. Like you can be in fifth, right? Like yeah. you're having a bad day. You're in fifth place. Shut the fuck up. Like yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's okay. That's, that's the good thing about like the national series versus the world championship is that there's not 30 of us. There's only 10 of us that are like really, I'm not saying that people outside yeah. talk to them, but they're on bikes that they, they can yeah. win, right? There's, yeah. there's like eight of us that are, can win a race mm-hmm. because of the machinery that we're on. If you take skill out of the equation. So yeah. hmm. what was the, the hardest part about that? I know you don't want to talk a ton about Moto2, but obviously there were some, some lessons learned, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the biggest takeaway that I got on it was that I should have like, I wish that I had better direction on like what to do. Like I, I just wish that somebody was like, "Hey, go live there." Like you, you need to live there. Bring your brother something. I wish I would have brought. So you traveled the whole time back and forth. Yeah, Oof, I stayed in. Tough. I stayed in Belgium for with Paul Sannon, who does like the motorhome rentals oh, yeah. for a lot of the riders for like a month. He gave me Rossi's motorhome that he had used before, and it was like all American inside, like the same plugs, everything. So I, he let me stay there for like a month or so, and I trained with his son. Uh, Nick Sannon and we went cycling with Tom Boonin who's like yeah legend yeah he's a legend and um that was really cool like I wish that somebody just like how Joe and Cam lived in Spain like nobody told me to go do that Mm -hmm. and I wish if I could go back and do it again I would do it with like a like even even in that super healthy like amazing relationship with Rachel I would want her there but I would also want like a best friend there or somebody like that because you have to like go out and just fuck around and have fun and do those things like Joe goes with his brothers like I think that's good like you need somebody who no matter what you're just always like gonna go have fun with and um it needs to be like your it can't just be like your wife it needs to be yeah I like how Crutchlow has like uh Mamola like he had Randy Mamola's son or just somebody like that that you could always hang out go cycle with ride dirt bikes with stuff like that so that was my biggest takeaway from it like thing that I would go back and do um I was just I was bummed that I didn't like ex- like take in the experience a little bit more. Mm. I have so many good stories with my dad though. Like I talked about it the other day when I was doing my live video and I realized like, wow, I got a lot of cool memories with my dad, yeah. but, and my brother Zach came over, but I, I wish I would have brought my mom over maybe at least once you know, or my sister or something. I, I didn't, um, it wasn't cause I didn't want to, it just, it just didn't, didn't happen. Work, yeah. yeah. Were your parents split up by that point? Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember the year that they split up, but, but they, yeah, they were, that was like right when it was like, happening so it was just mm. i'm pretty sure yeah it was yeah not not great was that tough dealing with that like while racing and changing you know we talked about it on kyle's podcast but just kind of how that changes your ecosystem at the track and like the day-to-day and just how you get through things yeah yeah definitely even, even to this day it's you know that's been 10 years ago and it's still just it doesn't feel the same and you know it whatever decisions you're parents made or whoever's fault it was doesn't matter I'm not even going to get into that whole thing but it's like you got to realize that you're you you know your kids are what matters at that point and you it's hard because like my parents their whole life it's like from the time they're 20 they had me and then it was just kids their whole life and they never really had time to like just do themselves right and that's what makes it so hard about being a parent is like it's so easy to just speaking from experience now, which is good to be able to look back on this thing and live and learn by, you know, maybe lessons that, that they, they taught me, but you got to like figure out a way to like, make sure you guys take care of yourselves and not just, just your kids Mm -hmm. that, you know, the kids are going to be okay. Like you need to take time to figure yourselves out. And they unfortunately didn't get to do that. And, and, um, yeah, my dad ended up just doing some things he shouldn't have done. And, and, you know, maybe, maybe he regrets it at the end of the day, maybe not. I don't know, but I think, I think that my mom is a better person on a friend's side of things. When I think of them, I think that they had their time. And I think my mom's a much better person than she was with him. And my dad, maybe the same thing. And we've moved past it and, and everything's fine. But it was, it was super, it was super difficult and didn't, you know, even to this day, it's like weird going to the track and it, it's just always going to have that weird feeling yeah. it's not the same yeah. as it was like you're not going to the track with your parents you're going to the track separate and like you're worried about like oh what if they see each other or it's just 
it's life. Everybody yeah. deals yeah, with yeah. this stuff. Just another <laughs> layer of shit to deal with. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we're getting to the end. I wanted to ask one last thing. What is uh, Josh Hayes is going to be back out there in Superbike again this weekend? What's your What's your opinion on on that? Like, obviously, it's sick that he's still around, still racing. Obviously, he's doing really well in Supersport. What's your What's your take on him uh, getting the opportunity? Uh, I think it's cool. I mean, it's you know you can't look at it. There's like, you know, I think just naturally somebody's like, oh, you should put somebody else on the bike. But also, like, you need to not not because I don't like Josh Hayes, but just because, like, you, you know, you want somebody else to get a chance. But then I think about myself, like, okay, it's, people think that about me, too, like, because they're just tired of maybe hearing my name all the time and getting this, a ride or whatever. Um, but he's the dude's a legend, and, he, like, Yamaha owes it to him to do things like that to, like, you know, for all the amount of championships and races that he won for them and, and all that. Um, I, I kind of like on my live video, I, me and Rachel kind of called it like, cause she saw Rocco was signed up for super sport this weekend. And I was like, Oh, like maybe Rocco is going to go to the squid hunter team. Hayes is going to go to Yamaha, but I don't think that happened. I think Hayes is still racing in super sport, yeah. but, um, yeah, it's cool. I mean, do I think that he'll go out and like be able to be competitive for a win? No, but he's still going to be like fighting in the top top yeah. six or whatever. Yeah. I mean, he did Road America. I don't remember what his times were at Road America, he's, but yeah, he got he's, to speed pretty quick. I yeah, thought. yeah. I mean, he's I, a legend, though. We were yeah. talking about it. I mean, JP were talking about it yesterday, and it was just like there's just really nobody else to put on the bike. That's the hard part too. It's like well, you got to. Like, I mean, so the, like it's one thing, right? There's a team you're burning money, right? Who are you going to put on that's competitive right away? Mm -hmm. There's really you talk about a young kid to give a shot it's tough to find that kid who's ready enough for a super bike that also i mean they're burning money right like as any team would be right you're burning sponsorship money and you've got to have two bikes that are to continue get the money yeah. right so i mean it's a logical choice especially after the road america thing and he was like up to speed pretty quick yeah. you knew it was just going to be the logical choice but yeah. I, I think it is a shame not to have a young kid, yeah. but I don't know if there's a young kid ready to even do yeah. it yet. I think it was, uh, I, mean, I don't know, you could tell me what you thought, but I thought Brandon was pretty impressive at, at Laguna. I know Laguna was different circumstance because there was so much grip, so you kind of get away with riding the bike a little bit, you know, not like a super bike and whatnot. But I think that was a good sign just to see some, you know, a kid more or less jump on it and do okay. Like, in my mind, it'd be like, it'd be pretty sick to see Rocco get a shot just to jump on these hack bike. I know it's super yeah. far-fetched, but like, you know, in a perfect world, it'd be, it'd be cool. Like they took a chance on you when you were 16 or 15, yeah. you know, that doesn't happen anymore. I think, I think the biggest thing <clears throat> that I thought about during it is like, okay, if you put somebody that's, I, I heard that Yamaha's committed to Peterson for next year. That's like just what I've heard. And I don't know if that, I've also heard rumors of Skoltz maybe not being at Westby's. I, I don't know. So maybe like, I think like, oh, what are the possibilities of Peterson going to Westby and then somebody from Europe coming? But but either way, say Yamaha committed to him and he's on attack again next year, you don't want to put somebody on the bike that's going to go do super well and then make him feel like, oh, great, like I don't sure. – maybe the, now they're going to change their mind or make him not have confidence going into next year even if they're 100% going to keep him. You don't want somebody who's going to just – be competitive with Gagne and then yeah. him be like crap like yeah. it's me it's Tony Elias effect when he came over yeah oh yeah when he came and replaced For Jake yeah yeah you don't want that to happen I don't I don't think and then also you don't want to put somebody on the bike who thinks they need to go win and they're going to go crash the bike and cost them a bunch more money so Hayes is the safest option he's not going to go destroy stuff he could bring some value to them because he can maybe give some feedback like Richard talked about in his podcast and they know for sure that he's going to finish the race and they're going to talk about him and it's going to be a win-win for everybody. They have Gagne that's up at the front, so they don't really want somebody to mess with him in the championship either. They need somebody to help him. Yeah. And it's like he's got an outside shot with a couple little here and there. Uh, he's got a podium. Yeah. So, yeah, for sure. You know, and for then sure. you got Yamaha still. So, I mean, it's a logical choice. I think you you, you could circle this all day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I was just it would have been your, nice, though. It would be kind of cool. Like, me and Bobby were, like, I asked him about it, and he's like, oh, they're going to bring somebody over. Like, or no, I said, I think I said, I don't know what it was, but then he was like, oh, but there's nobody available. Like, who? They're all racing. Even if it was somebody in Europe, like, who are you going to put on the yeah. bike? Yeah. Like, I saw Tampa. I saw Top Rack, like, posting, yeah. like, that he wanted to come, and yeah, he saw imagine. that race. <laughs> like, imagine. Been, I mean, you saw, like, Tito get on that McCam's bike and do pretty good for BSB. 
Who? Tito Rabat. Oh, Rabat. Okay. Yeah. And like you look at like, oh, that one would have been a bad because he's technically yeah. a free agent, but they just locked him uh, right for the rest of the year. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I mean, it would be cool to put somebody from Europe. I think the more Europeans that come over, yeah, it's not good for Americans, but it raises the the level as far as um, eyeballs, yeah. right? And it just, I feel like America has this like weird credibility thing that they always fight. Yeah. What yeah, I, mean, your, I think that's been the best thing about you this year is you've been done better than the two last European superstars who've come yeah, over. Yeah, but then everybody says, oh, the bike's better now. Yeah, or people like, are always going to say that shit. But at the end of the I day. I also rode the bike that he rode last year, and it was I felt just as good on that yeah. bike. Like, it wasn't like yeah. it was some magic bike. 100%. I was going to ask what your guys' thoughts were on Europeans coming over. Like, do you think do you think that they're better than us, or do you think that we need them to elevate a little bit, but we're just as good as them? Or do you, what do you think? I mean, in, in my opinion, I mean, I think exactly what I just said, like you're kind of showing, obviously, you know, the tracks you've been here for 20 years, right? Um, there's just not enough rides. So you keep bringing over superstars and all of a sudden it's going to be a paddock full of superstars who are looking for a yeah. fun trip to the U.S. for a year, you know? If you were to put like Marquez on Gagne's bike, what do you think he would do? He'd, he'd win. Like right away he would just smoke everybody or what do you think? Mm, uh, it's tough tires and tracks for sure. But Dude, you know, he would. I mean, I, I think Marquez is a pretty good level. And yeah. I think him coming over with the confidence, he would either put it in the tire wall or win. What about like a Zarco? I think, but I, I think this is, guys. I think really? they would all do very, very well. But I, I also think like just coming from BSB, knowing that if you took, the guys here and went to BSB, even though I think the talent is the same or better, they would struggle. Yeah. Just yeah, like if you took, sure. I think if you put Marquez at Olton Park, I think it would be like, Ugh. I mean, like, I think he would do well, but I think as well, like BSB has got a little different thing. I think the level in America is high. I just feel like the, the way we do things in America is a little bit, lazy compared to like you said when we i don't have the budget either though no no no. what i mean by that is is like getting up to speed being like cutthroat i feel yeah. like it's a little bit more like hey like let's go out you know in 20 minutes we'll like kind of throw down a heater yeah and i'm in like bsb world championship you're like fighting people to get out of yeah. pit lane to do the fastest lap in wet dry whatever and i think like you said coming back you can see cameron coming back he's riding different than in my opinion, he looks, his way body language, way more aggressive. And I think that's the biggest thing that America is kind of lacks is the aggressive. And you saw like, you know, Hayes had it for a while. But I don't know. I, I think Americans can do it 100%. Yeah. I really, really believe that we have the talent level. I think when Europeans come over, it gives us credibility. Yeah. Do you think that they look at our races and think that we look slow? Because sometimes I watch our races and then I watch World Superbike and I know we're like the same speed. But our races look super slow, and I don't know if it's because the tracks are the, slow. I think and the, the depth of the field is the problem. But even like if you're watching like a qualifying lap, it just like the way we tip the bikes in, mm -hmm. like because the bumps on the tracks, like well, it just I, looks weird. I also think that their riding style is way different. If you look at Chavi, Gooch, Loris, <laughs> Gooch Petruch, um, all those guys that came over, what do they do? They break as deep and as late as possible, and I feel like. Like, I don't know if it's a thing over there and it's just come from top rack and it's been a thing, Tires. but like, over yeah, but even Elias did it. Like he was, always but over here, we don't really do that. I mean, it's becoming more and more, but like even cam now, like he's come from Europe and he's now a late, late, late breaker, chavy. But like, if you look at all those, like their style of riding is as deep as possible. Can't make it. Let's figure out how to just make the corner going as deep as possible. It seems like, mm. and I think it hurt Petrucci last year. Because I feel like he didn't quite have, he would he was compared to the Yamaha, it would struggle a little bit. But if you look, it seems like the riding style is more aggressive under the braking zones, mm. in my opinion. Yeah, which makes it wild. Yeah, no, I I think so too. I think factors, tires, and all that kind of stuff too is a big difference, right? I mean, that's what Petrucci kind of complained about was the tires, and and even this year in World Superbike, he's struggling because of the tires. Yeah. Like, I think if you watch him ride. Over there now, he looks the same as he did here. Mm -hmm. Didn't really look any yeah any different. But I think you take a guy like that, who was a podium finisher on the factory bike, he struggled a bit on the other bike, came here, was right away like top top four, right, mm -hmm. and goes back to World Superbike, and now he's like 
just getting to the point after a little bit of time. I, I think him, he needs more time than what most people expected. Yeah. Just in general, you're kind of seeing that. But yeah, I think if you take any of those. I feel like uh, if you took like a few of them, like Martin, like I think there's a couple like super stars, like yeah, Martin, yeah. you know, you, Jorge you Martin. See the, you see the things that those Ducati guys do on the stock bikes? Yeah, Chavi told me that Martin's really good. I mean, he's, he said that a lot of the guys, it's pretty, it's nuts, like that they're not, not comfortable on, on stock bikes, but some of them are gnarly. Yeah, well, like the World Ducati. But they're not like race. stock, stock. Like yeah. I've got a parts list of like what they actually put on really? them. And it's not like, it's more like a super stock bike, but with, you know, mm. not flashy bodywork and stuff. But mm. it's still like, yeah. well, they're like three seconds off the World Superbike pace on a mm-hmm. kind of stock bike. Like, <laughs> yeah. But I think that's, that's how good the Ducati is as well. Like yeah, when you put sure. some stuff into it, I mean, you can just see it's so it's crazy, but yeah. listen, we're, we're we're getting long we're in here. Three we, hours now. Yeah, yeah we gotta we, cut it. We gotta uh, cut it. <laughs> yeah, we gotta cut this one. But let's uh, let's finish up with the last last one you had. Oh, uh, yeah, the big one. Have you watched through a full podcast of ours yet? Not the whole thing. No, no. Whoa. Yes, you missed. You missed. You know, no, this one's gonna hit you hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, do it. yeah, do it. All right, well, you. Oh, uh, well, we know like, why you're on death row. Yeah, you're, sure. you're on death row, probably doing some stupid shit in the parking lot. <laughs> um, you're locked up. You got your last meal. Your whole day's last meal. What are, what are your breakfast, lunch, dinner? What are you eating? My meals? Yep. Well, just do the last one. You're your last dinner? Your last dinner. Right, your last, your last by, dinner. Sponsored by Fresh and Lean, dude. We can't dude. be like... Dude. <laughs> Listen, Fresh right, and Lean... Fresh and Lean's going to make you a special, special Fresh Whatever and Lean Whatever you want. Whatever you want. What's it going to be? Oh, man. Ooh. Probably my mom's like spicy pork chops and mashed potatoes, some corn, some A1. Okay. Yeah. Right. Are you drinking? But I just found out. Oh, yeah. What? Of some light. margaritas. Oh, oh margarita. yeah. okay. Or a Mai Tai from, from Maui. Okay. Mai tai from Maui. <laughs> and anything for dessert? Mm, dang. Yeah, some banana, some banana, no wafer pudding. Okay, yeah, so we've got a home cooked meal with some mai tais or a margarita, and a banana wafer pudding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's that's good. Yeah. Thank you. That was straight to the point. We've had some weird ones, yeah. but that's that's our first home cooked meal. Okay, Kay, Kay asked me yesterday. She was like, "What do you think Josh's last meal is going to be?" I'm like, "I don't know. Maybe like wiener schnitzel or something." <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's so weird. Yeah. It's a. It's what a, was Joe's? Joe oh, had like a burger, big, I think. Big Kahuna yeah. burger or yeah. something. He had some weird burger. <laughs> and it took like him a while. Or something like that. It took <laughs> him I just a got a um, food sensitivity test done, and that was pork was like one of my things. So, oh, really? But no I'd still pork. eat it. Yeah. <laughs> you just run it, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Run it. It's your last meal. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, Sick. dude. Thank you so much for coming on to the pod. Um, I didn't think we were going to have you on, so this is really, really cool. I didn't know a lot about you. I hope everybody... Um, got the same as I did, but thank you again for me and for everybody. Yeah, same here. I think a lot of people hopefully will watch it, and um, you know, I think I know you feel like there's people out there who don't like you, but I think if they listen to this, they'll they'll understand a little bit more that there's a little more of a, like a method to some of the madness on on why you do things, and yeah. you're not a you're not just an idiot. There's, there's <laughs> 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 you're, you're out here, you know, with a with a with a purpose behind what you do so yeah. uh super interesting stuff and i think next next time we have somebody on that's got 20 years of experience we have yeah. to do a, little bit of a, a part one part two because yeah. we could have gone for another couple hours yeah. So yeah for sure thanks for uh thanks for doing it taking some time i don't think we actually talked about it but we're here in brainerd so that's why we're, it looks like we're in a log cabin yeah. <laughs> well this is just a new studio <laughs> yeah but uh thanks for taking time away from the track and we'll do it again soon no worries thanks, thanks boys. thank you